This is Hatsune Miku, Japan's sensational virtual pop star. She's released over 100,000 songs in multiple languages and performed sold out concerts around the world. Her image has appeared in games, on TV, in car races, and is even etched on the side of a Japanese space rocket. I came from Hatsune Miku, Carlos. She's Lady Gaga's favorite digital pop star and opened shows for her in the US three years ago. Tens of thousands of fans attended her exhibition and live shows near Tokyo recently. She's everything to everybody. That's probably why she's so popular. Miku's creator, Hiroyuki Ito, and his Sapporo based company have been developing the virtual diva for over 10 years. Both the software and character are named Hatsune Miku, meaning the first sound of the future. Originally based on Yamaha's Vocaloid technology, Miku the software has a sound bank containing voice samples and a huge array of tools. You input the melody and lyrics, then Miku the character sings them. To date, Krypton has sold 120,000 software licenses at $200 each to fans around the world who use it to create numerous songs and share them online. Some of the fan-created songs are chosen to be part of Miku's concerts, for which they're paid a royalty fee. Also has other revenue streams. It makes money from merchandising, licensing deals, and concert ticket sales. According to the real-life musicians who perform with Hatsune Miku, the virtual pop star is interesting and surprising. For Ito, Miku has the potential to change the way we think about music. For her fans, it goes even further.
Now, there are a lot of fitness gadgets out there. In my quest to get fit, I tested 17 of them over the last few months. At least one personal trainer I know was a little bit skeptical. Yeah, I've been watching these new technologies come to the market for almost as long as I've been a personal trainer. They're just tricks and tropes. They're not much different than the Bowflex machines or, to be honest, the original Jane Fonda workout video. But some of these gadgets that are just coming to the market do so much more than what they used to do just tracking your activities. Out of all of them, this chest strap was my favorite. It comes with a robot coach that points to the future, one where you might not need a human trainer at all. And it works like this. You wear the chest strap so that it can read your heart rate, and that connects to Move's free app that talks to you. Welcome to Move Heart Rate Hit Outdoor Running. Let's get moving and warm up in zone two. Move's computerized coach tells you what to do at that exact moment, whether you're running outside or you're doing body weight exercises indoors. Swing your arms faster to get your legs moving quicker. Let's crush this round. And by reading your heart rate, she knows exactly how hard you're working. She keeps you honest. Way to go. You are in the target zone. Keep pushing. You're almost at the end of the round. Don't give up. I've been running for seven years now, and my biggest problem is that I never push myself hard enough. I end up going on the same slow, comfortable 30-minute jog, but the Move HR Burn blasted me out of that rut. By the end of these half-hour exercises, I was drenched in sweat in a way that I never am when I work out alone. Training with a real person is great, whether that's your group instructor or your coach or your personal trainer, but humans, they're expensive. For the rest of us, this $60 gadget is all you need.
what does it take to change the world? A big army? A cure to a pandemic? A revolution? All of these take either a lot of people, thousands of hours, or massive amounts of space. But for Julian Assange, all he needs is one room, an internet connection, and the world will listen. Assange is located here, and more specifically, right here. And from that location, he's posted government secrets, classified documents, and leaked emails from some of the world's most powerful people. And in doing so, has been labeled a hero, a villain, a nihilist, and everything in between. This is how an Australian programmer sequestered in the Ecuadorian embassy in London became one of the most influential and notorious people in the world. Born in 1971 in Townsville, Australia, Assange has always been on the move. Living in over 30 homes by the time he was in his mid-teens, Assange, along with his mother and half-brother, finally settled down in Melbourne. His introduction to hacking started at 16 when he was given a Commodore 64, which he attached to a modem. He attended the University of Melbourne, where he studied programming, physics, and mathematics. He never graduated, but that doesn't mean he didn't get an education. By 1991, Assange hacked into the Pentagon, U.S. Navy, and other branches of the U.S. government. In 1996, he was caught by the Australian Federal Police and charged with over 30 counts of hacking and computer-related crimes. He didn't get any jail time, but he was fined $2,100. I think the first taste of what would come later was the hacking that he did as a young programmer, and that really sort of foreshadowed a healthy skepticism of the use and abuse of technology by governments. That's Vernon Silver. I'm a reporter for Bloomberg's investigations team. Assange's youth as a hacker laid the foundation for him to start WikiLeaks in 2006. But what is WikiLeaks? It's a website that posts unfiltered, usually classified documents. What separates it from every other media outlet is that they have no editorial hierarchy. With a publication like the New York Times, information comes in, they take that information, package it, then disseminate it for the public to see. WikiLeaks, however, cuts out the middleman. WikiLeaks gathers information, most of it given to them anonymously. So what they're doing is really very simple. They get the information in one end from who gives it to them and out the other with sometimes minimal interference. Julian Assange is the leader of that, the mastermind, the creator, and really because he thinks of it as a journalistic enterprise, the editor-in-chief. But every story starts with a source, and Assange has some unconventional sources. Julian Assange does not hack as far as we know. He is the recipient of people who are either insiders who give him secret documents or hack emails from a foreign power. That's Eli Lake. I am a columnist for Bloomberg. And there was no source bigger for Assange than Chelsea Manning. He used to be known as U.S. soldier Bradley Manning. In 2010, Manning provided Assange and WikiLeaks with hundreds of thousands of leaked government documents. WikiLeaks quietly began releasing the documents in February of 2010, then made big headlines in April by posting what is now known as the collateral murder video. Come on, fire! It was a vivid, graphic video. It changed the debate on the Iraq war, and importantly, it put WikiLeaks on the map when they put it online, and they couldn't be ignored at that point. And those leaks were just the beginning. They went on to post more than 90,000 leaked documents known as the Afghan war logs, 390,000 documents known as the Iraq war logs, and a quarter of a million private messages between diplomats called cables in what is now known as Cablegate. These leaks were met with very real ethical questions. The problem with publishing those cables was that a number of confidential sources for U.S. diplomats who faced real danger when their names were exposed. Then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton drove the point home that every country, including the United States, must be able to have candid conversations about the people and nations with whom they deal. Shortly after Cablegate, the Swedish government issued an arrest warrant for Assange on allegations of rape and molestation. He claimed the allegations were fabricated to get him extradited to the United States, a claim the U.S. government denied. Either way, Assange's next move was to seek refuge in the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, which really was the beginning of the new chapter in his life and what we're dealing with now, which is him being stuck in London. What was supposed to be an office in an embassy is now Assange's self-imposed prison to this very day. But that doesn't mean he's slowed down. Since being trapped in the embassy, WikiLeaks has released files about Guantanamo Bay prisoners, Syrian political figures, and the draft to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And then came the 2016 U.S. election. Thousands of leaked emails show Democratic Party officials possibly plotting against Bernie Sanders in his race against Hillary Clinton. 
Over the course of 68 days, WikiLeaks released 20,000 confidential Democratic National Committee emails. In terms of the presidential race, if you look right here, when Assange released the first batch of emails, Trump actually takes his first lead against Clinton. I think we've had enough of the Clintons in all fairness. Once WikiLeaks started exposing secrets of the Democratic Party, Julian Assange became a hero to many on the right. Public opinion kind of flip-flopped. WikiLeaks! From the emails, we now know Hillary Clinton's campaign manager makes risotto, and also how the DNC squashed Bernie Sanders' campaign. One thing we don't know is who gave Assange the stolen emails in the first place. Many leading Democrats say they suspect it was the Russians. They released an analysis from a private cybersecurity firm that had said it was the Russians. But Assange claims... Our source uh, is not the Russian government, uh, and it is not a state party. So this is where we stand today. The public still doesn't know who provided the emails to WikiLeaks. Meanwhile, Assange is still running WikiLeaks and still releasing documents. In March 2017, he started publishing documents from the CIA's Center for Cyber Intelligence called Vault 7. The CIA, the agency charged with finding and keeping our top secrets, can't keep its own secrets. As long as Assange has a connection to the world, no government secret will be too far from exposure. Julian Assange is still in the embassy. Maybe he'll leave, maybe he won't. Kind of regardless, his work has been done. He's changed the way people think about their governments, about their own secrets, about their own hackability, and really the world has changed because of him. This entire video is based on a true story. When I do like motivational speeches or even tell myself like, love yourself and you should love yourself. This is Lily Singh. 
but to fans all over the world, she's the YouTube star Superwoman. What if everyone's a girl? Superwoman. I know we can change the world for the better one positive day at a time. My parents now know what I do. <laughs> they didn't know what I did for a long time in the beginning of my career. I was just making videos in my room. They had no idea. Mom, Dad, have you seen my keys? I can't find them anywhere. Because you're always on phone. Until someone called them, like a family member from another part of Canada was like, Canada, is your daughter making videos? And the mom was like, I don't, I don't know, Lily, oh, Lily, are you making videos? <laughs> Just making videos grew into an entire career. Today, Lily's YouTube channel has some 12 million subscribers, over 2 billion views, and guest stars like Michelle Obama, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, and Seth Rogen. I think a lot of young girls are raised to believe that you're going to go to school and then graduate and then get married and then get a job and have kids. And Lily was on that path, all the way through a psychology degree at York University in Toronto. But when she started thinking about a career... I started to immensely panic and think something was wrong with me because I tried to figure out my life and it wasn't working in that straight line. It was 2010 and YouTube was only five years old. I thought nothing of YouTube. I, I was probably the last person in my circle of friends to discover YouTube. And I remember when I did, I thought, this is so strange. There's people making videos in their rooms and other people are watching them. So she figured, why not give it a shot? I one day posted a video because I was sad and I wanted to be creative and happy. She didn't know how to edit video or write scripts, so she winged it. It was so bad and so cringe, and my expectation was literally nothing. I was like, I'm gonna put this video up, a couple of my friends are gonna watch it, probably make fun of me, and that's gonna be the end of this. The second and third video came from, wait, 70 people watched my first one, can I get 80 to watch the next one? She kept creating, she kept posting, and the viewers kept coming. Lily had found an audience. A lot of the comments were, oh my God, there's a brown girl on YouTube. More specifically, Indian. Lily's parents immigrated to Canada from India, and Lily was born and raised in Scarborough, near Toronto. My home life was awesome. My parents, even though I portrayed them to be quite strict in my videos. Oi, Lily, when the rest of your skirt, huh? I teach you like this, to walk around like this, showing everything to everyone. They actually aren't like that at all. They're pretty modern and pretty cool. Your dress is short. Don't know what for. And we're pretty lenient with me. I mean, I got to, I got away with a lot of things. I was a brat. This is this is. The, I was a brat. She had a different idea of what she wanted out of life than other kids. In a grade school graduation slideshow, her classmates said they wanted to be lawyers and doctors. And then I came up and I was like rapper. Looking out with your friends, man. But then you say that you hate how. I could just feel my parents being like, why? Because that's just not something women really did in the Singh family. I know there was a ton of people that weren't happy about my birth being a female, so I think, and that's some real-ish, but it's, it's, it's a real thing. The best thing I could have done to prove to so many people that didn't want my mom to have a daughter was to become Superwoman. What up, everyone? It's your girl, Superwoman. It was the name of Lily's favorite hip-hop song by Lil Mo featuring Fabulous. I love the song so much because it was one of the only songs at the time that was an empowering female song where Lil Mo's going on about like, I will save guys with my superpowers and I will save girls with my superpowers and I am the superwoman. I thought, this name that I've had for so long that empowered me when I was younger, I'm gonna make this my screen name. Maybe this should be a new series. Superwoman didn't just burst onto the scene overnight with a viral video. It was a steady climb fueled by hard work. The moment that I thought this is going somewhere and this could be a career was the first time I performed internationally. It was in India. And it was the first time where I was truly across the world and people knew my videos. Singh has transformed herself from a bratty kid to an internet personality to a media mogul. She started a feature film, A Trip to Unicorn Island, in 2016. And her book, How to Be a Boss, hit the New York Times bestseller list in 2017 while she was on a 30-city international tour. Lily started out with the goal of getting millions of subscribers and financial security. Hurry the hell up! But after surpassing those goals, success has new meaning. I really come to terms with the fact that my, my definition of success is what's the best legacy I can leave behind. And it's not the number of views, the number of subscribers. It is the number of people that can say, this girl changed my life or changed something in my life positively.
is often found in the brains of deceased athletes, military veterans, and others with a history of repetitive brain trauma. Hundreds have donated their brains to the VA Boston University Concussion Legacy Foundation Brain Bank. This is a former NFL player who died in his early 70s. And this is a, a veteran uh, who also died in his early 70s. Dr. Ann McKee dissects these brains. The hippocampus and the mammillary bodies are very important for memory. I can see that they're slightly affected. McKee recently dissected the brain of former New England Patriots player Aaron Hernandez, who was convicted of murder and later committed suicide. You'll see right away that the brain is showing signs of shrinkage. You can see the crevices in the brain that you can't see in the normal. McKee says Hernandez's severe case of CTE impacted his decision-making, depression, and ability to control rage and aggression. Right now, she thinks we're underestimating how many people have CTE. We were able to distinguish between CTE and controls and CTE and Alzheimer's disease. The next question is, can we do this in the blood and can we do this in living people? And we aren't there yet with those answers. But the need for a diagnosis in the living is motivating companies such as Quanterix in Lexington, Massachusetts, to work faster on technology that could diagnose concussions and CTE in as few as 30 minutes. Kevin Rosovsky is the CEO. It's like a high-powered microscope. And so by doing that, we can see little biomarkers that you couldn't see before in the blood. Quanterix received a grant from the NFL and just went public. Since then, its stock is up more than 40%. The company sells a machine called Samoa for $175,000 to other biotechs, hospitals, and researchers. And for the first time in history, we're able to see brain health in blood, and that's a major breakthrough, and that's leading to less invasive testing, and we've already been able to see evidence of concussions, and there's the beginning evidence of being able to see the accumulated effect of concussions. Quanterix is also trying to detect Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, and ALS. Rosovsky says he thinks diagnosing concussions will be easier than diagnosing CTE. Diagnosing CTE in the living probably is a couple years away. We're real excited to see the progress, but reducing some of that work into actual tests in a laboratory takes time. There's regulatory approvals. There's a lot of um, red tape that you have to go through. Also in this race to diagnose CTE in the blood are Athlon Medical and Exosome Sciences. And New York's Mount Sinai Hospital is scanning for the disease in the living. But it's just one step in a series of questions for those with serious head trauma. There's still no cure for CTE. Even if we had a great idea for a treatment, there's no way to test if, whether it's effective or not. So that's the enormous advance that we'll get if we can develop a biomarker for this disease. In Boston and Mostu, Bloomberg News.
Wine is a $300 billion global industry where one person's opinion can make fortunes or break them. That's because of this man, Robert Parker, and his newsletter, The Wine Advocate. For three decades, he dominated as the world's most influential wine critic. Now Parker's protege is building an empire of his own. Antonio Galloni runs Venice. Antonio, tell me, what are you trying to build at Venice? Well, at Venice, we started with the idea uh, in 2013 of building a world-class platform. We have a database of about 250,000 professionally written reviews. On Delectable, we have 7 million user reviews. De through Delectable, we also have a partnership with Whole Foods and several other partnerships that we can't announce just yet. And when you put that all together, what we have is something that no other company in our space can even come close to. Do you think of yourself as the next Parker? Not at all. Why? Uh, because Steve Jobs said you can't live your life trying to be somebody else. So that, he's one of my biggest influences, and I've never wanted to be a replica of somebody else because a replica is never as good as the original. Bob is a, a genius, fantastic, one of a kind. Um, we're going to be something completely different, and I have no, no desire to be some version of somebody else. Different in what way? Um, every decision that I've made at this company is... Okay, guys. As you can see, we closed position on Euro at 115.51. 115.66 we uh, sold short about a week ago, 115.51, 15 pips, 1,500 pounds. Okay, guys, stay safe, and I'll speak to you later. Experienced active wine critic in America wants to work with us. That says something. When Alessandro Masnaghetti, who's the best cartographer of wine vi of, of vineyards, wants to work with us, that says something. When Neil Martin, who's a superstar wine critic with enormous experience in Bordeaux and Burgundy and the former lead critic at The Advocate, wants to come and be part of our team, that says something. You make it sound like The Wine Advocate was a disaster as a company and a miserable experience as an employee. No, it was, it was great because I got to work with Bob Parker when he was at his prime. You know, and Bob was like a second father to me. And we talked on the phone all the time and he gave me great advice. Can anyone's palate dominate the wine criticism business the way Parker's did? And should anyone's palate dominate it the way Hintz did? I just think the world is very different today. You know, the, I mean, it's just a totally different world. It's probably not healthy to have a single person dominating the world. The, the, it's not even wine criticism, it's the wine industry. Yeah, it's prob that's probably not the healthiest thing in the world. Um, but I think that there's just such an opportunity right now with social media and technology to reach such a massive number of people that I think it's possible that one or two people will actually have more influence than Bob Parker did. Because they will, they will again, this goes back to your first question, not trying to be a version of somebody else. You see this in sports all the time. It's like, oh, well, nobody will ever beat this record. And then somebody comes along. You know, it was like tennis, Pete Sampras. Nobody's ever going to win as many Grand Slams. I have two guys who are ahead of that and one knocking on the door. And, and so I think a lot like that. You're a former investment banker. How does that inform and influence what you're doing and what you've done? My generation has had to deal with a lot more challenges. That's why I think we're actually much better poised for the future. My first job in finance, the first thing that happened was long-term capital, 1998. <laughs> then the tech bubble melted down. Then there was a... Uh, mutual fund trading scandal. You know, that was all like within about five or six years. And these are the things that I had to deal with as a young executive. My peers who were 20 years older didn't know how to manage in crisis. They'd only seen Black Monday. They'd just been in a big bull market. It's very different. So I, I'm very lucky people of my generation or a little bit younger have actually had to deal with a lot more crises. I think that's actually good for learning how to cope with challenges in business. From the outside, it kind of looks like you're trying to demolish the house that Parker built, right? You left the wine advocate. Yeah. You merged with one of his chief rivals. Yeah. And you just hired his successor, Neil Martin. Mm -hmm. So are you? I think what that says is that all the best people want to work at our company. And that's really what we strive to create starting in 2013. We wanted to create a world-class company that would attract the best in class talent, and not just on the content side, on the technology side, on the digital side, our office, and at every level, what we're trying to, we only hire superstars, and we're looking for those superstars.
the world of professional wrestling, there's something called a swerve. Hulk Hogan has betrayed WCW! Some examples. These tag team partners are called baby faces, or the good guys. Then one of them swerves when he super kicks his tag team partner in the head, quickly assuming the role of the bad guy, or what the wrestling world calls the heel. Are you kidding? What a despicable act that was! Or a match is almost lost when, what's that? The superstar wrestler appears out of nowhere sprinting down the aisle to save the match. It's the Warriors music! It's the ultimate warrior! That's a swerve. So it should go as no surprise that World Wrestling Entertainment, known as the WWE, the most popular brand of sports entertainment in the world, is prepared for any swerves that come their way. So here's the story of how the WWE learned to see the swerve coming. So I spoke to Bloomberg reporters Felix Gillette. I'm a writer for Bloomberg News for the global business team. And Kim Basin. And I'm the U.S. luxury reporter at Bloomberg. To find out exactly how the WWE is positioning itself for an all-out global invasion, which starts with a massive change to their lucrative pay-per-view model. WWE basically pioneered the pay-per-view model on cable. I remember as a kid, when the pay-per-view events came up, all of our friends would scramble around and try and get one of the parents to, to pay for it. But in 2014, they took a huge risk. They saw a little bit sooner than some of the other entertainment brands that where this whole thing was moving was away from cable and satellite television and towards on-demand streaming video apps. They made this risky decision, in essence, cannibalizing that pay-per-view model, which they had essentially built. And after some early turbulence, it's working. Roughly 1.5 million people are paying $9.99 a month for the WWE app, making it the fifth most popular streaming OTT service. This adapt-or-die approach is in the WWE's DNA. Over the past 30 years, the company always seems to think two steps ahead. In the early 90s, WWE was at its most threatened when Ted Turner took them on with WCW. Which stands for World Championship Wrestling. And back then, the WCW was winning the ratings war. So in order to compete with them, WWE had changed its product from a family-friendly kind of cartoonish style to this really raw. That's why they called their show Raw. It was this raw style of, of, of wrestling. With violent, outrageous, reality-inspired plot lines and aggressive personas. From a 16-foot ladder! And they won that fight against Ted Turner. And they bought WCW. The early 2000s ushered in an era of testosterone-driven programming aimed at the red-blooded American male. Bra and panties matches and people smash each other over their head with, with like barbed wire bats and things like that. Until 2015, when WWE fans started a hashtag, Give Divas a Chance. Since then, WWE has hired 40 more female wrestlers. And that growing cast of female characters was part of a much larger plan. They started to try to appeal to a broader set of people. Let's attract more female fans. And after we've attracted more female fans, let's attract more international fans. They're broadening their base, and they're doing that in large part to make it more advertising friendly. And not just friendly to advertisers. They're trying to build up their fan base in China. They're trying to build up their fan base in Europe. They, you know, already have a pretty good fan base in India. India is a place where they already have an established wrestling culture because of the gigantic Indian wrestler, the great Kali. But there's still a lot of work to do. While the WWE set a revenue record in 2017, only 30% of it is coming from an overseas audience. And there's one person whose responsibility is to grow that number. The buck eventually stops at Vince McMahon, no matter what's happening within WWE. Yeah, he's a very controlling guy, and it's a very, very, very tightly scripted company. And that goes all the way down the board to the big stars' entrance music. <laughs> and their, their outfits and things like that. So with a CEO like McMahon always planning two moves ahead and an aggressive push into multiple international markets, a big issue is money. It's hard to do all those things simultaneously without committing a huge amount of capital to it. And that's where the WWE becomes an attractive company for buyers. Potentially, one thing that could happen with WWE is they could benefit by being acquired by a bigger technology or telecom company, an Amazon or Facebook. 
Facebook or a 21st Century Fox. So with a market cap of $2.8 billion, the advantage of owning 100% of their own content and a rapid consolidation spreading throughout the entertainment industry, it looks like the WWE is well positioned, even if there are swerves ahead. Our world is changing. Every day, it changes a little faster. Some changes are too small to see. Others, too big to handle. Sometimes, change feels slow. So slow, we don't even notice. Other times, it happens all at once. And we can't keep up. For our climate, change means many things. And between too small to see and too big to handle, there is a whole world of difference. The clock is ticking. This is Bloomberg Green. Saving the seas. This week, the deep sea diver who stopped riding the ocean's obituary to find a solution. And Rick Sala tells us why the next 10 years matter most. And globalization needs to get greener. Shipping accounts for nearly an eighth of all transport emissions. How can the industry clean up its act? Plus, protecting coastlines comes at a huge environmental cost. But one Israeli startup found a way to keep the sea out and the animals in. From London, I'm Anne-Marie Hordern, and this is Bloomberg Green. After more than a decade of studying the ocean as an academic, Enric Sala realized he was writing the ocean's obituary. He quit his job and became a full-time conservationist. As an in-house explorer for National Geographic, he's clocked more than 5,000 open water dives. He's also founded Pristine Seas, a project that combines exploration, research, and media to lobby countries to protect their oceans. To date, it has helped create marine reserves equivalent to half the size of Canada. I spoke to him about his mission and why it's so urgent. The state of the world's oceans is really bad. We have lost 90% of the large fish in the ocean. Sharks, groupers, cod, tuna. More than half of the fish stocks are overfished, which means that we are taking them out of the water faster than they can reproduce. More than half of the ocean is affected by industrial fishing, and global warming is killing coral reefs all around the world. The ocean is in a trajectory of decline. Can you just visualize for our viewers who never get to see the kind of things you are able to see, what an ocean and healthy ecosystem looks like versus one that's next to a bustling economic and industrialized area? Coral reefs in the United States, in the Florida Keys, are down to only 2% of what they used to be. Before, 80 to 90% of the bottom on a coral reef in the Caribbean was covered by live coral. Now, Florida Keys have only 2%. The average in the Caribbean is about 5% of the bottom covered by live coral. The rest is covered by slime and seaweed. And most of the fish you can see are this big. And it is very, very rare that if you jump into any place in the Caribbean at random, you see a shark. It's very, very rare. Now, let's go to Millennium Atoll, for example. An atoll that is an inhabited and fished south of the equator in the Central Pacific belongs to the Republic of Kiribati. 2009, we conducted the first, the first underwater expedition to this island. And I still remember the first time. Jumped over the side of the boat. And as soon as the bubbles cleared, I was surrounded by 15 gray reef sharks. After a couple of minutes, the shark decided that we were boring and they went back to do their thing. And you look down, 90% of the seafloor is covered by thriving coral. And it's full of fish and a sea turtle comes by. Now this abundance that we rarely see anywhere except in well-managed marine reserves. This is what the ocean used to be like, and this is what we have learned from going to these pristine places. And you write in your book that you're writing the obituary of ocean life. What's the cure? The cure is doing less harm. Basically, there are three things that we are doing to the ocean. One is we are taking fish out of the water faster than they can reproduce. Two, we are turning the ocean warmer and more acidic because of man-made climate change. And three, we are throwing in everything that we don't want, our waste and our plastic. We need basically to reverse these trends. Does this mean that a lot of this falls to governments and their policies? That's a big part of it because it is governments that regulate fishing and mineral extraction and oil extraction. 
is government that have the legal authority to create large marine reserves in the ocean, but also local communities have While Enric Sala explores what lies beneath, a new satellite is giving us data from above. We'll learn more about our oceans and climate change, but from space. A new satellite's been launched from California. Its mission, track the accelerating rise of sea levels. Well, the main instruments on board uh, include a dual-frequency radar altimeter. And this is the primary instrument of the mission, and that's the one that's measuring sea surface height, significant wave height, and wind speed over the ocean. And from those measurements, we can actually have uh, the superb measurements that we expect um, of sea level rise. Data gathered from Sentinel-6 will be used alongside information from other satellites to build as complete a picture of the oceans as possible. With a, a, a long record, we can precisely uh, measure the acceleration we eventually can detect new regime, tipping points. For example, if there is a runaway in the melting of Greenland or Antarctica, sea level uh, will uh, record this uh, runaway change uh, because it is an integrator of all changes that are occurring in the, in the climate system. So we, we will be able to see some, some change, big change in, in, uh, in the global climate. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration expects that sea level rise will increasingly threaten U.S. coastlines. One example, the southern tip of Manhattan is expected to flood 20 to 40 times a year by 2030. 11 uh, of the 15 largest megacities are located at the coast. And this number will double, in, um, I mean, the, the number of um, uh, people living in, in coastal area will double in, by uh, 2060. So uh, it, knowing how much sea level is rising at the coast and how much it will rise in the future uh, in coastal areas is as uh, obvious, uh, it, it's obviously a major goal uh, for, for human beings. Coming up from sails to steam to oil, the shipping industry is no stranger to change.
but how will it navigate the next transition? This is Bloomberg Green. From Bloomberg's European headquarters in London, I'm Anne-Marie Hordern. This is Bloomberg Green. Now for your roundup of this week's latest climate news, Jennifer Zabazaja has your Green in Brief. Here's the climate news you need to know. Deforestation of the world's largest rainforest has hit a 12-year high. More than 4,000 square miles of the Amazon rainforest was destroyed in 2020. That's a 9.5% increase from a year earlier. Government data shows that destruction has soared since President Jair Bolsonaro took office and weakened environmental enforcement. The Amazon is home to millions of species and plants and is critical in the fight against climate change. Bitcoin is hitting all-time highs, but at what cost to the environment? The cryptocurrency is energy intensive and there are concerns if it becomes mainstream. According to MIT, back in 2018, Bitcoin's carbon footprint was almost as big as Portugal's. Want to get better at tackling climate change? We'll hire more women. That's according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Firms with 30% or more women in top jobs tend to perform better when it comes to the environment and are more likely to set clear climate goals. Shopping online is more popular than ever now, but the price of convenience is measured in CO2, and more deliveries means more fuel burned and more packaging wasted. So what can companies do? Well, many are becoming more efficient and sourcing more clean energy for their data centers and warehouses. And England's farmers will be paid to go green after Brexit. As European subsidies are phased out, they'll get new money to encourage them to produce healthy, sustainable food. Poor farming practices are one of the leading drivers of water pollution and the loss of biodiversity. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja in New York. Anne-Marie, back to you. The shipping industry is more than just the grease on the wheels of globalization. It's its chief enabler. 11 billion tons of goods are transported by ship each year. The biggest contributors being 2 billion tons of oil, 1 billion tons of iron ore, and 350 million tons of grain. According to the International Chamber of Shipping, 80% of Europe's imports and exports happen over the seas. And for such a vast industry, it also contributes its fair share of emissions. Shipping makes up 12% of global transport energy consumption. So how does it clean up its act? Earlier, I caught up with Bloomberg Green reporter Laura Milan about just how big of a challenge this is going to be for the industry. 
one of the main issues is size. So um, about 90% of the world's cargo is moved by ships. So obviously changing such a huge uh, industry is not going to be fast and it's not going to be easy. The second issue is uh, has to do with technology. So uh, ships obviously uh, travel for many days at sea. It's not as easy for them to refuel as it would be for a car, for example, going on a road. And the sector still hasn't found a technology that's economically viable and that's uh, zero emissions and equivalent to, to the electric batteries for cars, for example. But actions are being put in place to make the industry a bit more environmentally friendly. Walk us through those steps that they're taking. That's it. So um, there's a a first step that would involve uh, using low emission fuels or uh, biofuels that would significantly reduce the existing emissions. And then at a regulatory level, when it comes to the policy and the governments, there are steps being made as well. I would say that the most significant ones come from the European Union, which started to track emissions a few years ago and is now looking to include shipping emissions in the emissions trading system. So that would significantly reduce and and help calculate uh, the emissions from the shipping industry. Now, uh, China is taking similar steps. So at the moment, regions need to report shipping emissions to the central government. And finally, we have the International Maritime Organization with a pledge to reduce uh, shipping emissions by 50% in 2050. Now, we must say that that pledge uh, has been considered insufficient by environmental groups, but at least some steps are being taken. So to get to 2050, the industry obviously is going to start tapping some new technologies. What new technologies are you seeing being introduced into the shipping industry? So we have seen pilot technologies being developed for years now, but what's interesting about this current moment is that we're seeing big players invest uh, in these technologies that are not yet economically viable, but that one day might be. So for example, we are seeing uh, earlier this year, the world's largest agriculture commodities trader, Cargill, saying they will invest in attaching sails to their ships uh, so they can make any technology that they run their ships on more efficient. Similarly, we have seen a spin-off of Airbus, the aeronautics company, developing a similar application with kites. We have been following also developments in hydrogen. So at the moment, hydrogen fuel seems like a good option, a a possible option when when it has been uh, developed and when it becomes uh, economically viable. And we have Vestas, for example, the world's largest uh, turbine maker, developing some ships that will be able to run on hydrogen in the near future. Coming up, rising sea levels means humans need to get creative when it comes to coastal defenses. But how do we protect both ourselves and the environment? One Israeli startup may have the answer. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg Green. I'm Anne-Marie Hordern. This is Bloomberg Green. After water, what's the resource that humans use the most? It's concrete, three tons a year for every person on the planet. And engineers estimate it's used twice as much as all other building materials combined. And it comes with a huge environmental cost. Concrete, not just in cities, it's a common feature on our coastlines too. And that's taking a toll on biodiversity. But one Israeli startup has found a way of making sea defenses stronger and encouraging life to thrive. If you take a look at concrete structures like breakwaters or seawalls, the water around them is often clear. That's not actually a good thing because it means there's no life. 
marine species are actually most abundant in coastal areas, but it's also where us humans prefer to live too. So when we build here, we drive away marine life. The concrete in the marine world has a lot of additives, a lot of chemicals, and some of those materials are actually leaching out and they're actually prohibiting marine life to thrive. We keep developing without any regards to natural communities. There is a tilting point uh, from which beyond we cannot really go back. coastal city of Tel Aviv, an Israeli startup wants to revolutionize our urban coastlines. Their sea defenses are transforming lifeless man-made structures into teeming ecosystems. They do this by replacing standard concrete with their own special cement formulas. As opposed to regular cement-based concrete, e-concrete includes certain elements uh, that enhance the growth of marine flora and fauna of plants and animals. Our admix, which is kind of our secret sauce, is basically kind of sealing the concrete, making it less aggressive for the marine environment. That once we add it, we enable life to flourish. In the lab, the team run tests to identify what mixes will work best for marine life. So we take really ice cube sized concrete slabs of different compositions and we put larvae, 20, 30, 50. We need to have a lot of replicates. We're geeky scientists, so we have to have a lot of replication and controls. And then within a few days or just a few weeks, we can get an answer on uh, their preference. So obviously if they die, they have a very low tolerance to that specific concrete mix design. And if they thrive or they flourish, we can quantify that uh, very quickly. E-concrete says it typically sees double the biodiversity of regular grey concrete. From fish and sea caterpillars on their armour blocks to crabs on these tidal pools that sit on the shoreline. This unit holds water uh, during the low tide, so it's always moist. And therefore it has um, a very comfortable habitat for uh, crabs and sea anemones and sea stars, etc. These pools have been here for less than three months. And this is already what you can see. It's covered with life see the rock around it, which has been here for probably 10, 20, maybe even more years, only has a thin layer of green algae and that's it. As well as the composition of the cement mix, e-concrete designs its products specifically to the marine environment it will be deployed, to create niches for endangered species or to develop nurseries like these oyster beds. The final part of the equation is creating complex surface textures to mimic natural rock or coral an environment that helps anchor young organisms. When concrete elements are being cast, the typical goal is to have a very slick uh, surface, very, very smooth. The idea is to get the water to flow right across it. When we're designing e-concrete with a rough surface, we want to do the complete opposite. We want to slow the water when they are crossing the structure so that the larvae can actually adhere uh, and attach to the surface. Concrete has to offer its clients more than just ecological credentials. Over time, they've discovered that creating hospitable habitats for marine life adds another advantage, one that is surely hard to ignore. We've seen evidence to the fact that the growth of the organisms on the concrete create kind of a layer of defense. Just the addition of weight, we can actually gain stability and strength over time. This is the, let's say, the, the unit when we put it in the water. And this is after a year in the water. And what you can see here is all the oysters are completely covering it. We designed the units so they can withstand the forces and perform in terms of structural performance, but they can also be a backbone for uh, ecological enhancement. The company tests its miniature designs in tanks full of real seawater, rocks, plants, and animal life from around the world. What we're looking for is the accumulation of calcium carbonate on the surface of the concrete of, by, of different mixes and different designs. This is the process that we call it biogenic buildup. So with time, we get a buildup of calcium carbonate that is sourced from marine organisms on the surface of the concrete. And we actually encapsulate the concrete with a natural rock. So when the organism die, in the case of a coral, it will die and then another coral will sit on it and that's how a reef is growing. The hope that our man-made structures could become stronger over time also means better economics. 
the units require less maintenance and could therefore stay in the water for longer. E-concrete though is just a few years old, so it needs more time to really quantify the longevity of its products. But the company are certain their products are better for the environment, and not just in terms of improving biodiversity. We're kind of trying to offset some of that immense carbon footprint of the concrete industry. Construction is responsible for about 11% of global carbon emissions. By adding a biological crust to their products, E-concrete prevents some CO2 from being released into the atmosphere. For every kilogram of uh, calcium carbonate being created by those marine organisms, we're offsetting 120 grams of CO2. So think about building a port infrastructure or a city waterfront that is an active carbon sink. I think that's a great advantage of the technology. That does it for this week, but let's keep the conversation going on Twitter. Follow us at Climate. I'm Anne-Marie Hordern, and this is Bloomberg Green. and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. Final trading day of the month. We're on track for another winning week. Four in a row, by the way, for the S&P. It is an update right now. We've got stocks, though, drifting. Traders are weighing disappointing earnings and bond market gyrations sparked by concerns over inflation and monetary tightening. Right now, we've got the 10-year up 5.30 seconds, 10-year yield 1.56%. Equities higher across the board with the S&P up now by three, a gain of just about one-tenth of 1%. The Dow up 55, up two-tenths of 1%. NASDAQ up barely, up now by just one point. After earnings, though, red on the screen for Apple and Amazon. Apple shares slumping 2.63% right now. Amazon down by 2.77%. And again, we've got gold down $16 a ounce, down 9 tenths of 1%, while West Texas Intermediate Crude is up 7 tenths of 1%, 84, 83.43 a barrel on WTI. The government reports consumer spending rose at a steady pace in September. The data point to sustained economic growth, a measure of inflation tied to the spending report, also increased, but household income dropped as extended unemployment aid ended. Michelle Meyer is head of U.S. economics at Bank of America Securities. And we are holding to our view that the fourth quarter should show a rebound. We're seeing stronger signs of consumer spending. When we look at our aggregated um, card data, we're seeing a really healthy uh, 
um, move higher in spending with um, the services economy reengaging um, with potentially an early start to the holiday shopping season. So we think we're going to see stronger consumer spending into the fourth quarter. Michelle Meyer of Bank of America Securities, Chevron higher after the oil super major posted third quarter profit that beat the average analyst estimate. Shares up now by 1%. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news as it happens. Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Bloomberg Quick Takes Tim Stenovic on Bloomberg Radio. All right, kids, it's time to put on a show. Happy Halloween. Jazz hands, everybody. What are you, gonna, you, what are you dressing up as? Are you about to even say that? Uh, I don't know. I've done it all. I've been a fairy. I've been a witch. Nothing this year? Nothing this year. All right. Just evil old me. All right. Let's get to it. Uh, live in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, streaming on YouTube. It is Friday. October is wrapping up, Tim. October 29th. Yeah. And it's a little volatile trading day, too. Uh, yes, indeed. The goblins at play. Uh, we're up. We're down. Uh, despite some disappointing earnings, it is volatile. Uh, we're going to lean in big time on Facebook. Uh, uh, meta. Thank you. <laughs> Every time you say Facebook, well, I keep forgetting to call it meta. We don't drink. We only drink when we say meta. Meta Platforms, Inc. Meta. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, I keep getting it wrong. Meta, meta, meta. Uh, we're going to talk about why the company needs more than a name change. little hint there, Facebook slash meta. Also a sign that meta is going after the Apple Watch. Yeah, leaked image includes a <sighs> camera on Mark, the watch. Mark Gurman, man. Yeah, he's going to join peeps us. and his investigators. All in, two on big banks and ESG. Mike Mayo, well-known bank analyst. He's got some things to say about that. Matthew Siegel is head of digital assets research at VanEck. We're going to talk all things crypto with him. Carrie. And then yeah. Carrie Smith, the founder of Unorthodox Ventures, mm. on a VC bubble. A few years ago, he sold his company, uh, the fan company. Big old fan company. Big old fan company. I don't think I can say those words on the radio. You can always say Half it a billion once. dollars. Yes. Eager to hear what he's been up to in the years since. And we're going to talk about Movember. It's just getting ready to kick uh, off in the Bloomberg Big Take about sand and money. You can throw a lot at it at the uh, coast out there on the uh, forks of uh, Long Island, but nonetheless might not save the Hamptons. All right, let's get to it and the Market Drivers Report. Let's set the Business Week agenda in the house. Uh, we've got witches, we've got goblins, we've got them all. Dave Wilson, stocks editor, he's a warlock at Bloomberg News. Katie Greifel, Bloomberg News cross asset reporter, also Bloomberg Quick Take co anchor. Also, if you had to well, dress up, what would you dress up as? Yeah, of little, she I'm just going to say Katie <laughs> brings cat ears to work every single year. I never wear them. And she never wears chicken them. Out. Chicken, no better. Do you have them with you? Up here. I didn't bring them to the Okay, studio. every right. year except for 2021. <laughs> Man, Dave Wilson, dress up ever? Well, when I was a kid. Oh, come on. <laughs> I haven't done it lately. Not even as Bruce? No, oh, I, I, I could tell you a story, but we'll save it for another day. Chart of the day, maybe? Can we squeeze it in? Well, we'll find out. <laughs> okay, find there's out. a tease. Help us out. It's There's a Bruce Springsteen piece to it. Of course there of is. Of sorts. Of course there is. Okay, up and down on the markets. What's going on? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look at it this way. If I told you Apple came out with earnings, people didn't like them, and the stock was down, what would you say technology stocks would be doing as a group down yeah no yeah they're up i mean which shows you something right there and if you look at the consumer discretionary category where you find amazon.com well that one would be up were it not for the loss in amazon that's hmm. what our numbers are, are showing here so you know it's been a bit of a rebound from some early declines i mean you're not talking about a whole lot of movement no. and uh, you're talking about a fairly even split in terms of uh those 11 main industry groups in the s p 500 just five up healthcare as it happens leading the way uh and there's more stocks down in the s p 500 than up so it's like we're ending the wheat without a whole lot of direction. I mean, and given the back and forth we've seen in earnings reports, uh, you can understand that. I sort of talked about the back, arguably, when I right. uh, you know, mentioned Apple and Amazon. If you want to know what the fourth is, uh, well, there are a few examples, but I like a smaller company, W.W. Granger. Ah, it's one of my gainers today. Absolutely, because it's a distributor that cuts across a lot of industries. Yep. And, you know, to have that stock up 7.5% after earnings, it gets your attention because we've heard so much about issues with the supply chain, and right. this company is kind of integral can to I the just, supply chain. Can I just say, uh, October, man, the NASDAQ 100 is up uh, almost 8%, and the S&P 500 is up almost 7%. Katie, it's been a pretty good month. September was a bummer. 
October was much better for the equity markets. Yeah, it seems like it. And it's, it is interesting to see that the NASDAQ 100 is actually outperforming because if you look at the bond market, we've seen quite a sell-off. I mean, mm-hmm. the SPY ETF that tracks the S&P 500, that outperformed the long-term Treasury ETF by about four or five percentage points. That's the biggest outperformance since March of this year. And typically when you see, you know, bonds really suffer and sell off uh, and those yields go higher, you would expect to see tech to follow suit. Not so, even with, uh, you know, some of the fangs. I don't know if we can call them fangs anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but disappointing this week. Right, exactly. What about the bond market? What about the bond market? What are you keeping your eye on Oh, my God, market? everything. Well, so- this week, everything, because you saw yields around the world doing crazy things. I mean, if you look at the U.K., you saw a huge sink in their long-term yields. If you look at Canada, their two-year yields surged by as much as 27 basis points on a single day this week. And, I mean, I haven't even Ten-year now about. at almost uh, 1.7, 1.68. Yeah, yeah. So it's been a big week for the bond markets. You saw a big flattening in our yield curve, just to bring it back to the U.S. Well, and that's what's important, right? Dave, we've got to think about, you know, where we are short-term in terms of long-term yields. In the long-term, you know, people are expecting maybe growth will be much more subdued. And this is going to be very tricky for the Federal Reserve next week. Um, we know their mandate. We know what they're about. They've talked about cutting back on some of the uh, on the purchases. They've laid that out very clearly. Uh, and they seem to be pushing off when it comes to rate increases. But they're still in, going to be in a little bit of a predicament. They are. And, of course, you have to remember at the end of the day, why do yields go up? In a lot of cases, it's because economies are doing well. Right. And if the economies are doing well, then why you need – you know, to throw money at bonds the way Fed, the Fed has been doing, or why do interest rates need to be near zero the way that they have been for years? I mean, these are all questions that no doubt the Federal Reserve uh, governors and policymakers will be dealing with, you know, as they uh, get together next week. Right, exactly. And rates going higher is also can potentially mean the economy is getting better. All right, me out of you, Katie Greifeld, <laughs> and you'll be back, born in the USA. Uh, we'll see if we've got that Bruce story in. Let's see the Bloomberg Business Week bite of the day. It's one number that tells us a lot, and it's brought to you by GEP. GEP helps businesses transform supply chains with strategy, managed services, and AI-based cloud native software. Learn more at GEP.com. All right, today's number, 8 billion Coca-Cola, close to buying a controlling stake in the sports drink maker Body Armor in a deal that values the company at about 8 billion, according to people with knowledge of the matter. You might remember back in 2018, Coca-Cola acquired a minority stake in the company, which counts the late basketball star Kobe Bryant among its earlier investors. Uh, This is what Coca-Cola does, though. Uh, You know, it's core brands. That is the bulk of what they do, but they have been very good for many years of tapping into changes in the market and picking up brands. Yeah, a a huge valuation for body armor here. Yeah, not too shabby. All right, never too shabby, of course, is our own Nancy Lyons. She always gets the songs when it comes to Chart of the Day. Hey, Nance. Hey, thanks, Carol. President Trump has been meeting with world leaders today. First, he had a one-on-one with Pope Francis. Then he spoke with French President Emmanuel Macron, hoping to repair relations following that deal with Australia on nuclear submarine technology that ruined a French sub deal with the land down under. Biden admits that whole thing was mishandled. What happened uh, was to use an English phrase, what we did was clumsy. It was not done with a lot of grace. I was under the impression certain things had happened that hadn't happened. Biden emphasized France remains a valuable partner. Macron says what really matters is what they do together in the coming weeks, months, and years. A new round of haggling is underway on President Biden's $1.75 trillion spending framework. The House is not in session over the weekend, but negotiations are set to continue. Progressives did formally endorse the bill, which was half the size of what they originally wanted, but they are also still holding up the infrastructure bill, upsetting moderates, who say that denied the president and the party a win, especially as Virginia and New Jersey voters are heading to the polls. Congressional Progressive Caucus head Pramila Jayapal says President Biden wants them to pass both bills, and the coming week will be critical for that. In Washington, I'm Amy Morris, Bloomberg Radio. Illinois Congressman Adam Kinzinger, one of 10 House Republicans who voted to impeach former President Donald Trump, says he will not seek re-election. His fate was sealed yesterday when Illinois Democrats adopted a new congressional map that eliminated his district. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. 
All right, Nancy Lyons in our 991 newsroom in the nation's capital. Carol Masser, Tim Stenovic. It's Friday. Uh, we are in our interactive broker studio, also streaming on YouTube. Hello to everybody watching on YouTube. A uh, couple of COVID stories we did want to get to. The CDC out saying a new study offers more evidence that COVID-19 vaccines provide stronger protection against hospitalization than immunity from an earlier infection. Hospitalized patients hmm. who weren't vaccinated but had been previously infected with COVID were about five times more likely to test positive for the infection than people who had been vaccinated, according to the CDC study. This is important because at a time, and we're going to talk about vaccine mandates in a few minutes, at a time when we are seeing vaccine mandates from uh, companies and from states or cities, I should say, yeah. federal government as well, uh, you have people who say, I got COVID already, so I don't need to get vaccinated because I have natural immunity. I hear it all the time. You do? I hear it all the time. People are, I had COVID, so I don't need to get the vaccine. And it's... So this is interesting that they're coming out. Um, CDC has, as you said, long recommended that they do it. Uh, they came out, Rochelle Walensky, the CDC director. We now have additional evidence that reaffirms the importance of COVID-19 vaccines, even if you have had prior infection. The study adds more to the body of knowledge, demonstrating the protection of vaccines against severe disease from COVID-19. This is our world. Each day we get, there's more studies. The longer this goes on, we have more information about the virus itself, the mutations, as well as the vaccines. And so sometimes the information may feel conflicting or different from what we've had in the past. Well, that's to be expected because the longer it goes on, we get better information, more sampling, right, of people who've had the vaccine or not and what that means. Hey, I just want to fit in this last story sure. here uh, uh, Riley by Riley Griffin, and I saw this interview happen on Bloomberg TV in real time. The CEO of Moderna saying that data is expected soon on an experimental flu vaccine. When we talked to Gregory Zuckerman, earlier this week about mm -hmm. his book, A Shot to Save the World. He talked about the idea of, in the coming years, having this one shot that will include flu vaccine and COVID vaccine potentially with mRNA technology. Yeah, so it's fantastic. Uh, check out that interview. It's CEO of Moderna, Stefan Bonsall, uh, talking to our colleagues over on Bloomberg TV. But you do wonder about it all being packaged in one.
sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. Stocks are drifting higher with the Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ all at records right now. With the S&P up 2 points, 4598. That is a gain of just about uh, one-tenth of one percent. The Dow also up one-tenth of one percent, up 35. NASDAQ up seven, up by one-tenth of one percent. And the 10-year yield, 1.55 percent. Stocks higher as traders wait disappointing earnings reports, along with bond market gyrations sparked by concerns over inflation and monetary tightening. On earnings, Apple shares down 2.2%. A red apple today. We've got Amazon lower by 2.8%. This morning, though, we did hear from Chevron. Its shares up now by 1%. Again, that 10-year yield, 1.55%. Spot gold down $15 the ounce, down 9 tenths of 1%. West Texas Intermediate crude up 8 tenths of 1%. 83.45 a barrel. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. You're up to date as we get ready to uh, really wrap up this month of trading. Almost, right? 30, oh, 31st. Yeah. No, oh, no, this, this is weekend. the final trading day. Yeah, November 1st on Monday. All right. Unless you're trading crypto. You can keep doing <laughs> it just, that. Right? It, just, it just happens. It just never stops, Carol. <laughs> All right. Connecticut also never stopping are the headlines uh, when it comes to the pandemic and uh, the vaccine. Connecticut and New York among the 10 U.S. states with the biggest declines in new cases during the week through Wednesday. That's according to the CDC. They put that data out today. Infections in the U.S. Northwest, though, Tim, they continue rising. Troubled spot, though, China. Yeah, Russia also suffering its deadliest September since World War II. Denmark, one of the highest vaccination rates in the world, will more than double its testing capacity after a number of virus infections jumped in recent weeks, seeing different things play out in different parts of the world and yeah. even different parts of the U.S. All right, so let's get to it. As he always joins us on Fridays, or at least typically, Dr. Ian Lusbader, clinical professor of medicine at NYU Langone, back with us, uh, and he is on the phone in New York City. Dr. Lusbader, nice to be back with you uh, on this Friday. The China stuff is troubling to me because it feels like they have been on top of it. We know that they have kind of basically locked people into their homes when there's outbreaks. They have a vaccine. And yet China, we saw intercepting two bullet trains headed to Beijing on concerned staff may be infected. They now have cases in almost half of its provinces from the latest flare up. China, does that mean their vaccine isn't working? How do you see that? Happy Friday, guys. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, we, we still are uh, wrangling with uh, COVID, and it looks like we will globally still uh, have quite a ways to go. Uh, certainly pandemic, perhaps endemic. But we're not done with viral mutations, right? As long as there is not really herd immunity, there's the opportunity. We're seeing this in the U.K., with the Delta Plus variant, that's about 6 to 10 percent. That is uh, somewhat resistant. And uh, to our alpha vaccines, that's really part of the problem, is until you get everyone either infected or, uh, or vaccinated, you do risk having these mutations. The data from China has always been a little sketchy, exactly how many cases, how well the vaccine works. Very unclear. It does appear that Sputnik and the Sinovac are not as effective as the, uh, you know, mRNA vaccines or even the J&J &J vaccine uh, that's been used. So I think that is potentially, again, a global risk, just like India when Delta first occurred. We were like, oh, just a few cases. And now that's a global dominant uh, strain. What's happening in China could be another risk, unfortunately. What about what's happening in the UK? Because I, I think about throughout the pandemic, we've sort of seen what happens in the UK start to happen in the United States a few weeks later. That's sort of how it's play out. Uh, NBC is reporting that a subvariant of COVID-19's Delta strain is now emerging in the UK, and it now makes up 10% of, of cases there. What's going on? So that is the AY 4.2 variant, and it is a, a, a couple of mutations in the in the Delta variant from our Alpha uh, original strain. Uh, even though it's about 10 percent, it does, and it appears to be slightly more infectious. It doesn't appear to be any more lethal or have any any further complications. So, I don't think that. Uh, at this point is going to be a serious risk to us or to the UK, but it does show how over time you're just getting more mutations. 
and potentially any one of them could be uh, more adaptable or more um, transmissible or more lethal. Um, although over time, we, we tend to see these viruses tend to mutate to be more infectious but less lethal. So that, I guess, is the good news. Um, I just feel like there's like the same headlines we're dealing with on a weekly basis, but we do get some more information, whether it's mix and match, you know, you've had the virus, I don't need a vaccine. We just talked to him and I earlier about, no, you actually still need to get the vaccine. As we all continue to kind of increasingly walk out into the world and start to resume our normal lives, what do we need to keep front and center here, Ian, when it comes to COVID? So certainly people who've had COVID, and many people don't know they've had COVID. They may be very, uh, they could have had a simple upper respiratory tract infection. Not everyone gets that sick. So we may have better herd immunity than we think. But for the people who do know they've had COVID, they may be able to get what's called hybrid immunity with really just one mRNA shot. Um, hopefully there's not a lot of vaccine hesitancy. But, um, you know, to get either a Pfizer or Moderna shot, if you've had COVID, COVID probably really boosts your antibodies and certainly would uh, boost your protection for a long period. But this is what we're seeing with some of the vaccine mandates and healthcare workers and cops and firemen saying, hey, I might have had it. Why, why are you making me go through a vaccine? Right. There's some data that it may be helpful, but there's also some data that if you've had it, you're reasonably protected for a while. But the CDC still says to get vaccinated even if you've had COVID. Yes, there's no question that getting the hybrid, you know, vaccine, meaning you've had COVID, you, uh, most people lose their antibodies over time, even if they have cellular immunity, but getting a booster shot definitely improves um, your antibody response and your survivability. So it, it is, but do you really need two shots after that? Most people would say no, probably one shot is all you need to boost your immunity and decrease your risk of transmission. So everybody should probably eventually get a booster, but that's, you just need one booster. You don't need two, right? Exactly. Those are the people who've, who've had COVID or who've had antibodies. And it's certainly reasonable for some people to check antibodies. If your antibodies are still positive, you know, yes, yeah. you would get a boost, but that's, you know, less of a serious concern. All right. Really appreciate it. Ian, thank you. Have a great weekend. Dr. Ian Lesbader, clinical professor of medicine at NYU Langone Medical Center on the phone from New York City. You know, I was at a point where I was racing to get a booster. I kind of pulled back and just thought, I got to wait my turn. It's funny how you see this play out. My brother, who's a teacher in Washington, got his. My other brother, who works in education, uh, just got his today in California. Right. We're seeing them certainly happen. All right. This is Bloomberg.
Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. You say Meta. Meta? Met, uh, Meta Platforms, Inc. Meta Platforms, Inc. You say Meta, I say Facebook. You say Facebook. Yeah. Uh, you say Apple, I say Smartwatch. <laughs> it looks like that's what it's coming for. Yeah. So we're going to hear what Mark Urban has to say because he's gotten a little glimpse into what Facebook slash Meta is up to. Uh, camera on the smartwatch. Exactly. Uh, do I not have you one? You don't have one on your Apple Watch. All right, all right. We're going to find out more. First up, let's get more on this last trading day in the month of October. Off we go to Charlie Pellet. All right, I thank you very much. Last update, I told you stocks were higher. Uh-uh, things have turned around now, retreating from records with the Dow, the S&P, NASDAQ, all on the minus side. Right to the numbers, we'll give you the why in a moment here with the S&P down five. That is a drop of one-tenth of one percent. The Dow down 16 now, down less than one-tenth of one percent. NASDAQ down 22, lower by one-tenth of one percent. Cannot ignore Apple and Amazon today after last night's earnings report. Apple down now by 2.4 percent. Amazon shares they're tumbling by 3%. Stocks drifting lower now as traders weigh disappointing earnings and bond market gyrations sparked by concerns over inflation and monetary tightening. President Biden met with Pope Francis today to discuss efforts to counter climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Andrew Pekosh is a professor of molecular micro at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and he says more has to be done around the globe to stop the spread of COVID. The vast majority of the world is really stuck at the starting line, meaning that they can't get enough vaccines to even initiate widespread vaccination campaigns, irrespective of whether or not there's an interest in the population to get the vaccine or not. So we really have a lot of work to do to get this pandemic under control at the global level. Dr. Pekosh with the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, which is supported by Michael R. Bloomberg, founder of Bloomberg LP and Bloomberg Philanthropies. Pfizer and BioNTech's COVID-19 vaccine is expected to be cleared today by regulators for children between the ages of 5 and 11. Now, this is according to sources in a long-awaited pandemic milestone that opens a new phase of the immunization campaign. Checking those vaccine names, Pfizer higher now by 8 tenths of 1%. Its German partner, BioNTech, down 3.1%. AstraZeneca down 1 tenth of 1%. Moderna lower now by 1.4%. J&J, Johnson, uh, Johnson & Johnson down by 4 tenths of 1%. Recapping stocks lower. Or S P down four, drop there of one tenth of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. An update on the markets as we bounce around on this Friday. But nonetheless, we were talking about those major equity averages for the month overall. You know, a 180 from what we saw in September, where we saw a bunch of selling. September historically can be a very rough month uh, for equities. October, while we remember historically some of the October crashes, nonetheless, October has been a bullish one, certainly when it comes to the equity trade. Yeah, such to see the best gains on the S&P 500 since November of last year. Right. Right now, in the last 30 days, uh, one month, I should say, the uh, Dow is higher by 3.8%, the S&P 500 higher by 5.3%, the NASDAQ higher by 6.3%. And Facebook, uh, Meta Platforms, is up about 2% uh, as we speak on this Friday. Hey, there's some news out there. Uh, first up, we got the name check, uh, name change, I should say. Then we got uh, the company going after the Apple Watch. Let's bring in Bloomberg News Technology reporter Mark Gurman joining us on Bloomberg Radio and on YouTube. So, Mark, what do you know? Thanks for having me. I yeah. mean, who else to talk about an Apple Watch competitor than the guy who covers <laughs> Apple, right? So um, we know, we've known for a little bit of time now that Facebook is working on a, a smartwatch. But yesterday, we actually got our first look at the device. We obtained a photo or a, an official render of the Facebook smartwatch. Uh, this, was, this is actually really cool. This is really interesting. So we found it with the help of a friend of mine, a developer named Steve Moser, inside of the Facebook app that the company offers to consumers today to control, remember those Ray-Ban smart glasses yeah. on Facebook that launched a few weeks ago? To control those. Huh. So they did a software update earlier this week for that app called Facebook View. And that image, if you really deep dive in, into the source code, into the file system of that application, it's just hiding in there. And they added it in there uh, this week. So uh, pretty remarkable stuff. 
Mark, the first thing that sticks out to me when I saw this image in the story that you published was the camera at the bottom of the smartwatch. What is that for? Because that's different than an Apple Watch. There's no camera on an Apple Watch. Oh, man, I don't know what they're thinking. So <laughs> first of all, it's like a notch, right? It's like a little circle at the bottom of the screen, so they cut into the screen. However, what I will say is that I think people have been clamoring for video chat on the Apple Watch for a few years now, and they mm. haven't done it because of battery life concerns. They certainly tested it. Totally. But imagine. Yes. You're right. But like, right. imagine being able to do a video chat on your wrist Love. for like a one-minute chat. Yeah. I mean, that would be kind of cool. Inspector yes. Gadget style. Right. I've done the phone call on it. I feel a little bit like a nerd, but it's been kind of cool. But you're right. If we could get a video chat, oh, my God, I would be all in. So that's Facebook's portal system. Facebook yeah. has this portal kind of like Alexa device that might work with it, right? Yeah, I mean, that would make sense to me using the same protocols there as that the portal uses. Maybe they'll brand it as a portal watch or some sort of device. What's interesting to me is that a lot of the feedback I've been hearing on this product already has been people saying, I don't want a camera from Facebook, let alone in my home. You're telling me I would want one on my body? Thank you. Right? Um, these are, there are real privacy concerns, and the Facebook brand was so tarnished in terms of privacy. Yeah. There's a reason they're meta now, right? Uh, so we'll see how this does. If the Ray-Bans are any indication, I don't think this is going to be a slam dunk. What I'm told is that Facebook has not made a final decision yet on if they're going to release this product, this particularly particular design. What I'm told is they've developed models aimed at 2022, 2023, and 2024. Mm. And when they decide to launch it, whether that's in 22, 23, or 24, they'll launch that corresponding model. So there's a possibility that they skip the 2022 version and their first model is the 23 or 24 version. So we still may have a few years to go, but maybe some newfound competition in the watch space for Apple. Well, that's what I'm wondering. Does it say something more broadly, Mark, about what Meta wants to do when it comes to the wearables market? And listen, they've got a great initial user base that they can tap, but I just, I wonder about it. Would it still be, if they get into it, a niche market for them like it is to somewhat, I guess it's safe to say, for Apple? Facebook is never going to win the phone. Sorry, Meta. Meta is never going to win the phone. It is way too saturated with iOS, Android, and some of the other devices you see from Samsung and Google and such. So they're needing to pick at the edges, okay. right? They need to invent this new category. So they're trying to own video devices with the portal, with this upcoming watch, and of course, what they're calling the metaverse with these VR and AR devices. So they're really going for the edges and they're trying to build up their own new ecosystem to pull people away from Apple, right? Yeah. The goal is is that Apple, that Facebook meta is gonna kill the iPhone and Android with these other types of devices, replace the phone with the metaverse, with the watch. I know it, it sounds all uh, kind of crazy, but this is yeah. what they're trying to do. Well, wait, go ahead. Okay, 10 Quick seconds, way. Mark. What is Apple trying to do in the metaverse? Apple is going to announce its uh, first mixed reality headset probably uh, later next year. Okay. And is Apple going to rename itself then? <laughs> Bring the computer back in, Apple Computer Inc. <laughs> Meet? No, Maybe they'll go to Meet? <laughs> Isn't that what Wendy's, Wendy's did? Said Meet? That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mark Gurman, you are the best. Have a great weekend. Mark Gurman, he's a Bloomberg News technology reporter. Covers, yes, all things Apple, but then when it's something going on that might affect Apple, he's on it as well. And that includes that news out of Facebook, or at least speculation about Meta, not Facebook. Meta, sorry. <laughs> well, let's go Drink to watch up, BBC for a check the latest world and national news. Nancy Lyons is standing by there in the 991 newsroom. Hey, Nance. Tim, climate is expected to dominate discussions at the G20 summit this weekend and the UN's COP26 summit next week. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres says he's extremely concerned about the lack of urgency among many leaders. Even if recent pledges were clear and credible, and there are serious questions about some of them, we are still careening towards climate catastrophe. And in the best case scenario, temperatures will still rise well above two degrees. And that is a disaster. Gutierrez says they need to do a better job at mitigating the problem. Well, climate did come up in the 75-minute meeting that President Biden held today with Pope Francis. Aides say the two men also discussed the pandemic, but they did not discuss abortion or gay rights. Officials say the connection between them was warm, and there was even some laughter during their meeting. Nice to see you. It's been a while. Yeah. You kept all your hair, and I've lost most of mine. <laughs> Biden previously met Pope Francis at the Vatican when he was vice president back in 2016. The Supreme Court will be hearing arguments Monday concerning the controversial 
controversial new abortion law in Texas that bans abortions after a fetal heartbeat is detected, which is usually around six weeks. Brigitte Amiri with the ACLU's Reproductive Freedom Project believes it's the start of a trend. We already know that politicians in Arkansas, Florida, and Ohio may try to follow Texas's cool lead. Amiri says it's outrageous the Supreme Court has not allow has allowed rather the law to remain in place. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Nancy Lyons. You know, thanks, Nance. Uh, Nancy Lyons there in D.C. Uh, you know, I did a little poll of uh, Meh and what people thought. Oh, yeah. Uh, what what people thought about that? Meta. And I said... Uh, Is it still open? Or it, <laughs> I think it might be uh, getting close to closing. Okay. I think I did it for a day or two. Uh, I said, do you think it's solid? Do you think it's meh? Do you think got nothing? And basically, meh and got nothing are neck and neck with about 41%, 42%. Uh, well, That's you know the what? Those people, Mark Zuckerberg would say, are living in the past. Because well, and he might be forward, right. He might be right. Again, I go back, Carol, to what Mark Zuckerberg did a decade ago when Facebook had no business in mobile. Yeah. And he made all the engineers use phones to access Facebook and build a mobile first system, a platform for Facebook, and look at how successful they've been. Or creating basically uh, a yearbook or a class book online. And this is yeah. what you and this is where you are today, one of the most valuable companies well, uh, out there. I'm not there. I'm on Instagram. But but still. I know. You're right. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm on, <laughs> All right. All right. We're going to move on. Uh, there is a story out by Dow Jones Wall Street Journal. And the FAA is planning some warnings to pilots and airlines over the new 5G rollout. I, you know, I just got back to flying. I'm always like, does, do I really have to turn, you know, go into airplane mode? Like, why aren't they checking? Because if I don't go into airplane mode, am I going to crash the plane? I always wonder. I, right? It's yeah. basically an honor system. Yeah, like when you're filling up your car and they tell you not to use your cell phone, too. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's one, too. Because of the sparks? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, U.S. air safety regulators are preparing to issue warnings to pilots and airlines about potential interference with key cockpit safety systems by a new 5G wireless service slated to go live as soon as early as December. This is according to current and former government and aviation industry officials briefed on the matter. Reading right from this story from the uh, Wall Street Journal. Yeah, Andrew Tangle and Ryan Tracy write that the FAA has been drafting a special bulletin and accompanying mandates that would say certain automated features that are used by pilots to help fly in land planes could be affected by wireless towers on the ground transmitting the new 5G signals, these officials said. The FAA actions aren't expected to be directed at consumers' use of cell phones. So what are they going to do? You get on a plane, you get a little baskets, you know, here? No, they say they're not, you're not going to be a consumer use of cell phones. It's the towers on the ground that are the issue. All right, all right. So something to uh, keep in mind.
sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Bloomberg World Headquarters. I'm Charlie Pellet. Final trading day of the month, and it's on to November. Where has this year gone? We've got the Dow higher, the S&P, NASDAQ both on the minus side right now. Ten-year yield, 1.55%. The S&P down two points, lower, little changed. The Dow higher, little changed, up eight points. NASDAQ lower by seven, dropped there of just about one-tenth of one percent. Any advance for the S&P and NASDAQ today will be a record. Uh, the Dow possibly just might see a record there. We've got the ten-year yield 1.55 percent right now spot gold down 16 dollars the ounce down nine tenths of one percent and west texas intermediate crude up seven tenths of one percent 83 38 a barrel pfizer and biontech's covid 19 vaccine is expected to be cleared today by regulators for children between the ages of five and eleven this according to two people familiar with the process pfizer up eight tenths of one percent its german partner biontech down 2.4 percent after earnings apple down 2.2 percent amazon down 2.8 percent and that's uh, bloomberg business flash all right charlie thank you so much you're right this month has just flown by um let's get to it because uh one of our reporters writing for bloomberg business week in the current issue of the bloomberg business week magazine it's online on newsstands also on the bloomberg it's about facebook now known as meta including how meta needs to change more than its name tim as the competition among the handful of big tech companies really is heating up alex webb is a correspondent for bloomberg quick take he joins us on the phone from london alex you write for the first time all five of the u.s tech giants are going to be competing directly it's not clear though that mark zuckerberg can escape his past how does this change that zuckerberg outlined this week and subsequent name change. How does that put all five big tech companies competing with one another head to head? Well, I mean, it, it's not name change in and of itself that renders the, the new competition active. But, you know, we've got at this stage Apple, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and Facebook all developing products in the augmented and virtual reality space. They are on a collision course to be competing with one another. The danger, of course, is Facebook. Or that Facebook has institutionally is that the name has become quite toxic. And uh, when you're competing with Apple, which has really forged a, a kind of cachet as a company that values user privacy and, and respects user data, that's something that Facebook has to deal with because clearly it's not something that we recognize Facebook for also doing. So setting, giving itself a new name is an effort to shed itself of some of that toxicity. Joining us also, Bloomberg Business Week editor Joel Weber. Hey, Joel. Hi. Uh, hi, Alex. Thanks again for the story. Um, yeah, it's like this, it's the great thing of like, are you willing to throw all your cards in the air and just completely pivot while you, you know, your your company and your brand faces like <laughs> the, 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 the most scrutiny it's ever faced and the heat just gets turned up and it's like, whoa, let's just pivot. <laughs> so, so Mark, Alex, like when you think about uh, Mark Zuckerberg's move here, like, Obviously, he's been talking about this for a while. How quickly, though, like, do people in the tech universe think that he actually maybe pulled all of this together in terms of, like, you know, executing it as a masterstroke or attempting to, to do so? I mean, this has clearly been in the works for some time. You know, they have they bought Oculus years ago, Oculus Rift, which is now all being rebranded as Meta. Um, the rebrand itself, it's hard to know how quickly that came together, but the timing is certainly opportune. You know, at a moment when uh, it, the criticism seems to have reached its loudest crescendo to date, um, you know, Facebook has been through plenty of crises in the past few years, but it really feels this time, and maybe I'm wrong, it just feels as though there is something a bit different. There is real um, meat on the bones of the things that they've been doing wrong. There are concrete proposals for what they can fix and what they should fix. And um, there is legislation in the works, both here and in the U.S., which gives regulators more power to force them to do stuff. So all those things come together as a perfect storm, uh, but the timing for, for changing the name is particularly appropriate. Well, it's funny that you say regulators, too, and I feel like <laughs> we have just problems getting basic stuff through sometimes in Congress. And I just think, how are regulators going to be able to really keep up with something like this that Facebook Meta is working on? It was a point actually made by Nick Clegg, of course, the former British Deputy Prime Minister, who now heads um, you know, corporate affairs and communications at Facebook. 
He said that the metaverse is not going to arrive tomorrow. It's going to take perhaps a decade. That means, in his telling, that, that regulators have more time to catch up with this than they might do normally. Uh, we know that they tend to be five years behind any technological innovation when it comes to deciding how to regulate it. Perhaps this time around, that won't be the case. That also might just be wishful thinking on, on our part and indeed his. Yeah. So, Alex, let's assess Facebook's opportunity here compared to the, some of these other big tech players who, who we, we also know, as you, as you wrote, um, will end up in the same uh, swimming pool. Uh, what, what advantages does Facebook have and how does that compare with, with the other companies since everybody's going to end up perhaps having multi-metaverses? Metavi? Is it plural? Yeah. I, I actually wonder, you know, it's clearly one of the risks with um, if you're running your own sort of metaverse, um, metavirus, um, metaverse, then <laughs> you are going to be having to manage that content and there are going to be content risks in this. And for all of the problems that Facebook has had managing content, it has got a lot more experience doing it than does, for example, Apple. And so that might actually prove to be an advantage if you find they are running the ecosystem themselves, that they have got people working on these problems already that might give them a jump start on Apple. What they don't have is a distribution network in terms of actually selling devices. Apple and Amazon in particular have incredible sales networks. Um, but Facebook does have an interesting partnership that it has signed with Essilor Luxottica. It's not a name that many people know, but it owns in the U.S., Ray-Ban, Oakley, Sunglass Hut, it controls 40% of the global eyewear market. And you can imagine that if you're going in to buy your glasses and there's also Facebook smart glasses in there, then it all of a sudden has quite compelling sales channels. That is not, as I understand it, the scope of their agreement with Essilor Luxottica just yet, but it is something that could evolve. Hey, Alex, can you talk a little bit about the uh, advertising opportunity in the metaverse? Because Facebook is an advertising company, and in your story you talk about the way that Facebook knows what you're doing because of what you're doing on Instagram and Facebook's apps. But how will it track you and then advertise to you in the metaverse? That is absolutely the potentially really creepy thing in the metaverse. Right now, Facebook has pretty granular data on what you're browsing, not just what you click on and the accounts you follow, but what photos you linger on. And, and therefore, just on Instagram, for example, it knows which things you look at a little bit more and is more likely to suggest that you follow similar content. Now, with the metaverse, they actually showed off technology which is sort of eye tracking, um, gauging your facial expressions. It showed them for different purposes to see what you're looking at in order that you could decide to, for instance, turn on a light um, and face tracking in order to show your expressions on an avatar. But it's not hard to imagine how that could also be used for advertising purposes and gauging your interest. If you're walking yeah. down the high street... And you, and you see a shop window and you think that and Facebook sees that that shop window is more appealing to you than another one, it can target ads in theory to you based on that. And I wish Facebook, Facebook could see my face right now <laughs> when you're describing Sorry. this to me, Alex. I, I, I'm I'm looking at your face right now, and you look a little dubious. Um, okay, I, I will not be seeing you, you in the metaverse. Okay, I, I was going to ask you: you want to do this program from the metaverse? Because what the, not the today. use case is like? I, I'm just I'm still really curious. Like the last time I really, really, really used Facebook was to like email a bunch of uh, graduates from my high school class to like organize help organize a reunion and now I'm like well the reunion was terrible anyway and I, I, using you know draw, <laughs> kind of getting drawn back into all these old friends what about Instagram though well I guess the, here's the thing that was like could you imagine like a reunion that just took place in the metaverse and you didn't actually have to like go back to that high school like okay that could and be then cool. you get to be an avatar and look like you did when you were 18 like that sounds better than dealing with reality anyway right it, it, it sounds not <laughs> but I mean, it doesn't. I don't know if it has staying power. If it's sticky, right? It sounds cool to do well, a few times. My dystopian view is that with climate change, we're not going to be able to go outside. So all we're going to have is the metaverse. <laughs> Happy Friday, everyone. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. You wouldn't, you wouldn't get teased for what we're talking about <laughs> later on the show. Miss Sunshine. All right, Jill Weber. Have a great, great weekend. Metaverse or not, uh, Alex Webb, correspondent at Bloomberg Quick Take. Check out everything and check out the new issue of Bloomberg Business Week magazine. This is Bloomberg Radio.
sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Bloomberg World Headquarters. I'm Charlie Pellet. We are one hour to go until the closing bell. Right now, we're looking at a mixed market. The Dow higher, S&P, NASDAQ both lower. Stocks are drifting. Traders are weighing disappointing earnings and bond market gyrations sparked by concerns over inflation and monetary tightening. Bottom line here, we're on track for a winning week. Four in a row for the S&P. Also on track for a winning month. Right now, the S&P down one point, little changed. The Dow up 15, also little changed. NASDAQ down four, a drop there of less than one-tenth of one percent. S&P has been swinging between gains and losses after opening lower in the wake of underwhelming results from Amazon and Apple. Amazon shares, they're down now by 2.9 percent. Apple shares are down by 2.2 percent. Tenure yield, 1.55 percent. Gold down nine-tenths of one percent, down $16 the ounce. At 1782, West Texas Intermediate crude up six tenths of one percent, 83.34 a barrel. Government data suggests widespread labor shortages are translating into fatter paychecks for many Americans. The employment cost index posted a record increase in the third quarter as businesses pay to fill record job openings coming out of the pandemic. Well, as for the economic backdrop, Christina Hooper is chief global market strategist at Invesco. So we're actually in a very good place today. The problems we have, supply chain disruptions, um, higher employment costs are all good problems to have given where we've been, just where we were 15 months ago. Tesla shares set to record their biggest monthly gain in almost a year to cap October with an all-time high market value. Tesla shares up today by 10% earlier this week. Of course, we had that deal with Hertz. Hertz shares surging again today up by another 11.4%. Recapping, S&P down one point, and that's a Bloomberg Business Flash. This is The Big Take, the best of Bloomberg's in-depth original reporting from around the globe. What we have to make sure we do as the economy recovers is look at the data kind of broken down a bit. These funds are becoming more and more expensive. You're looking at $15 billion for their entry level. There have been waves of immigration that have faced a lot of resistance. There's a lot of color behind the scenes and a great untold story. How did Bezos really come out on top? As the cover says, Jeff wins. He always seems to win. <laughs> The Big Take on Bloomberg Radio. Yes, indeed, it is time for The Big Take. It's also among our most read on the Bloomberg today. Yeah, you put Hamptons in a headline, and everybody is reading on the Bloomberg terminal. And Polly Mossens is investigative reporter for Bloomberg News. She's with us in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Unlimited sand and money still won't save it's the It's a great Hamptons. headline. <laughs> what is at risk out east? Well, I think the biggest thing that's at risk is a community and a way of life that's become, you know, very popular with not only Manhattan residents, but people in Long Island and even people from abroad. The Hamptons is a huge tourist destination. And not to mention, it has one of the largest commercial fishing ports that exist mm -hmm. in America still. It has a really robust local tourism economy and a local fishing economy. So I think beyond just being a destination for tourism, there there is a local economy and a natural economy that's worth protecting. All right, so let's talk about that. Because we do talk about the coasts in general that are just eroding year after year because of climate change. So what are they doing to kind of reverse that? So there are two... Or hold on to. <laughs> push back on the ocean. <laughs> There's two big things that we can look at with this particular project. And the first is sand renourishment, which is basically taking a bunch of sand out of the ocean and putting it back on the shoreline. The idea is that then when a storm hits, there will be more sand there to protect. And also when the floodwaters rise, there'll be more sand to just fight them back a little bit. The second thing we can do is actually pick structures up. We can take them off of their foundations that are at sea level. We can put big pilings into the can ground. Can I just say, Tim came in and was like, down. do you know you can actually like move buildings? <laughs> it was really funny. Today I learned. <laughs> yeah, you can, I mean, you can move them in two directions. You can move them up or you can move them inland. And in this particular project, they're planning primarily to move them up. So that's really going to change what some of these neighborhoods look like. Because they know? can't really go back because there's other stuff behind them, right? Exactly, yeah. So they'll go up into the air. 
And those are sort of the two big projects that the government is undertaking. But there's also things that private homeowners can do. Well, this is one thing I was saying with Tim, because I think there's a lot of controversy, especially when it comes to these very expensive homes owned by wealthy individuals on um, the coastlines. And when they get wiped out from storms, it's like, who's the resp- who takes the responsibility for rebuilding it all up? Um, so it's a, And this is a case of government and private money helping so, to shore up. Really, it is kind of two kinds of money. You have the government money funding FIMP, which is a really big project, but you also have private individuals who have been participating in pretty robust climate change retaliation measures, sort of <laughs> what I call them. And that includes building seawalls, which are not cheap. They can be fifty to two hundred thousand yeah. dollars. That includes restoring beaches on their own dime. They can choose to do that. And some people have actually chosen to lift up their houses themselves, not through the government program. So while the government is certainly spending a lot of money here and plans to, there have been private individuals in that area who have chosen to embark on some of these things themselves to try to protect their property. What I find particularly fascinating about this is it's not like this has really affected real estate prices in recent years, at least in the Hamptons. Not in the Hamptons. People want to be in the Hamptons no matter what the real estate costs. But I do think something to keep in mind is that we do have the national flood insurance policy here in the U.S., and that applies everywhere, including the Hamptons. I pay for it here. I live just outside um, New York City, lower Manhattan, and I'm in what they consider, it's just across, it's just a little bit far from the Hudson River, not very far, and they consider it a flood area. Yeah, anyone who's in a flood zone can still get insurance. So just because your property is vulnerable doesn't mean that it's completely unprotected. It's interesting, too, and what I like about you, the story is not like, oh, my God, they just started doing this last week. I mean, this has been something over how many decades, right, that man has been dealing with um, because of climate change and just the interaction between humans and nature. And you do have to sometimes wonder, do we look at what's going on there as maybe some solutions that might help us in other parts of the country or in the world? Absolutely. We've sort of been uh, talking with my colleague and I, Eric, who I wrote the story with, we've sort of been saying, whatever works in the Hamptons, we'll try other places. But if it fails in the Hamptons, and all of the money and power and influence of the Hamptons cannot get this thing accomplished, then it might not be worth doing elsewhere. Hence the metaverse. I've been <laughs> yes. really like a Susie Doom today because it's it's like, you know, because of climate change, we'll soon not be able to go outside or we won't be able to enjoy beaches. And so we're going to pretend in the metaverse. I'm sorry. Is, is the truckloads <laughs> of sand day. solution realistic? You know, I think that it is realistic in the short term. When we look at what happened this summer with the truckloads of sand, the town of Montauk replenished a really popular surf spot, and it worked. For that summer, it worked. People could surf there, and people could go to that beach. But when we start to look at climate change the way that coastal scientists do, which tends to be in centuries, not in beach seasons, then we have to ask ourselves, does this really work? And there's really only one thing we know that works, which is not living on the beach. Yeah. Well, and what I thought was interesting where you started um, is that this whole idea that these are important economies, and it's not just a little local town or something. Like you said, it's international tourism. It's fishing. So we're talking about our economy going forward and our livelihood for so many. So it's not just some wealthy people in their beach homes. It's a lot more significant. Absolutely. I think that's something important to keep in mind is that there are these wealthy people, but there's a whole economy of people who are more middle class who are keeping that whole economy afloat. And their homes and their property matters just as much. I mean, it's just, it's so surprising to me the way that you write about the most expensive homes out there, even with these risks selling at a premium. Absolutely. And not just a little bit of a premium. I mean, they have skyrocketed during the pandemic. Is that because these wealthy individuals, just in 30 seconds, are able to foot the bill for seawalls and foot the bill for protection if they have to put their house on stilts? I think that's part of it, but I think it's also culture. You you know, if that's where all your friends are hanging out, you'll pay to hang out there too. Yeah, it's become so popular. I remember going out to Montauk, like when I was in college, years ago, and nobody was out there. And it too, you know, it's just pushed further and further south, or I guess, is it south, north, kind of, like when you go out the forks, but to the tip of the island, and it's now, Montauk is, is a cool place to go. You should have bought some land, Carol. I should have, would have, could have. Yeah. A lot of things. Should have bought some Bitcoin, too. Um, <laughs> Polly, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. It's a great story. It's one of the most read, and it is the Bloomberg picked, uh, b- uh, Big Take uh, on this Friday. Written by Bloomberg News investigative reporter Polly Mossens, along with Bloomberg News sustainability editor Eric Rosted. Check it out on the Bloomberg and also at Bloomberg.com. A what? really good one to read online because it is so interactive. So, I always love when they do this. All right, let's get to World of National News. Back to Nancy Lyons in D.C. Hey, Nancy. 
Carol, it has been a busy day for President Biden. He met for more than an hour earlier with Pope Francis discussing the climate and the pandemic. Then he had a discussion with French President Emmanuel Macron. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern says during those talks, Biden admitted the nuclear submarine deal with Australia that scuttled a French sub deal with Auckland was mishandled. When the press was there, he did say to uh, the French president that it was clumsy and it could have been done with much more grace and he thought the French were informed. So potentially that awkward, AUKUS situation is behind the president. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern in Rome. Macron told Biden that what really matters is what they do together in the coming weeks, months and years. Wages and salaries continued to rise last month, as did consumer spending on goods and services. Bloomberg's Zerf Chapman has more on today's report from the Commerce Department. Employment costs rose sharply, which put more money into consumers' pockets, suggesting stronger economic growth for the rest of the year. Michelle Meyer, head economist for Bank of America Securities, said in a Bloomberg interview. There's more purchasing power for the consumer. There's more inflationary pressure building in the broader economy. We're seeing stronger signs of consumer spending, the services economy re-engaging with potentially an early start to the holiday shopping season. The fourth quarter should show a rebound. Meyer said higher wages along with supply shortages, are also translating into higher prices. In Washington, Irv Chapman, Bloomberg Radio. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. This is Bloomberg. All right, Nance, thank you so much. Carol Masser, Tim Stanovic. We are in uh, Bloomberg headquarters here in New York City, Interactive Brokers Studio. Not we are on in YouTube. The metaverse. I'm where we could buy NFTs Climate to change. put on our virtual metaverse. walls. Where would you go? In the metaverse? Yeah. I'd probably go to space. Would you? Yeah, why not? It's kind of like. Hang out on some other planets. If you've done Space Mountain, you kind of know what that's like. Oh, come on. No? No. Okay. If you've done maybe Blue Origin or <laughs> SpaceX, then yes. I'm ready for it too. It's a quick trip. I mean, it's faster than getting to, like, Wait, 57th the Street from here. You, the no, no, going up to, into oh. space. Yeah. Um, hey, let's talk, <laughs> let's talk about a couple of crypto stories that uh, came to our attention here on the Bloomberg. So, um, Ether, second largest cryptocurrency, soaring to a record about 4400 on Friday. I should check the most recent price. Bullish sentiments surrounding an upgrade to the Ethereum network and rival Bitcoin's recent rally to a high of its own. Some of the reasons why. Yeah, a little earlier today, as of 2.41 p.m., the token was trading around 43.87 in New York, rallying as much as 4.8% just a little bit earlier in the day. Other tokens, including Binance Coin and Solana, also rallied. Ether is now worth more than $520 billion. That's according to data from CoinGecko.com. Did you buy any? No. I know. Here we are. Strike two again. <laughs> Bitcoin missed it. Ethereum missed it. Um, then there's an NFT we know just sold for $532 million. Folks, it didn't actually sell. And what's cool about this story is you can actually see this NFT that didn't actually sell, an image of it, which raises an entirely new debate about is it then? What do you own when you buy this? Don't you feel like there's somebody sitting in like a bunch of desks and like, we're just going to screw around with them. Like, we're going to play around. Let's see what people know. buy. Look, I, th I think this is something that we're going to be hearing more and more about. But what people have compared NFTs to is the idea that you can buy a poster of the Mona Lisa, but it doesn't mean that you actually own the Mona Lisa that's in the Louvre. Well, people, I, I know. It's, I, so people do buy replicas of things? Right. But what is it? It's digital. Right? Yeah. That can be recreated digitally. <laughs> it's uh, unclear to me. Anyway, fascinating by Nick Baker on the Bloomberg.
headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet, developing story headline from the Bloomberg Professional Service. FDA says it's a go. The FDA authorizing the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID vaccine for kids between the ages of 5 and 11. Now, right over to the first word breaking news desk for today's afternoon call. Here's Bill Maloney. And good afternoon, Charlie. U.S. stocks quiet today after disappointing earnings from Apple and Amazon. Dow's currently down six points. S&P's dropped five. NASDAQ is lower by nine. The U.S. 10-year falls to 1.54%. Gold is down 17. Transports dropped 35 points. But Bitcoin is higher by 1.2%. Among the main 11 SB sectors, only healthcare, telecom, and tech were in the green. Real estate was under pressure. And leaders to the upside in the Dow, Intel, Microsoft, and Merck, while Apple and Dow Inc. led to the downside. After earnings this morning, Chevron rose 1.1%. ExxonMobil was little changed. And in other news, the FAA plans warnings to pilots and airlines over the new 5G rollout. And wrapping things up, Tesla and NVIDIA hit fresh record highs. Live from the First of Breaking News Desk, I'm Bill Maloney. Charlie. Okay, we thank you very much, Bill Maloney. And that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie. COP26 about to get underway in Glasgow, Scotland. With that in mind, Joe Matthew, host of Sound On here on Bloomberg Radio, catching up with EPA Administrator Michael Regan in our 99 studio in D.C. Joe, take it away. Thank you, Carol. With all the debate around the president's economic agenda and, as you mentioned, the looming COP26 U.N. Climate Summit, we wanted to drill down on what exactly is in this framework that the White House came out with yesterday, knowing that a number of proposed climate initiatives did not make it into this plan, at least as we understand in its current form. And that's where we begin with Michael Regan, Administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, making his first appearance on Bloomberg. So, Administrator, welcome. Thank you for being with us. Knowing the Clean Energy Performance Program did not make the cut, what will President Biden tell world leaders next week that America has achieved on this front? Well, thank you, Joe. And the president will tell the world that $555 billion dedicated to mitigating climate change is what is central to the framework. And he's confident that in his conversations with both Congress and the Senate, that it will get through, and he's awaiting that on his desk. He's very excited about the historic investment that this represents to combat climate change and to invest in public health protections. Uh, this is really exciting. Uh, these are real investments that will impact real people. What are they investing in, and will they help to clean up the power grid, for instance, without that climate initiative that was initially proposed? It will. You know, this framework will position the president to meet his goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 50 to 52 percent by 2030. Uh, that's 10 times more emission reductions than any legislation Congress has ever passed. There are, in this framework, there are clean energy tax credits and rebates that lower the cost for middle class families, saving American families hundreds of dollars per year in clean energy costs and lowering the cost of electric vehicles by $12,500. It also will stand up a new civilian climate corps and enlist a new diverse generation of about 300,000 members uh, who will conserve public lands, bolster community resilience, and address the changing climate. And listen, it will ensure that clean energy technology from wind turbine blades to solar panels to electric cars and batteries can be built here in the United States. And lastly, I'll say, with all of these investments, uh, the president has a Justice 40 initiative. Forty percent of all of these federal resources will go to communities that are disproportionately impacted by pollution, environmental justice communities, and communities that need it the most. There's been a lot of anticipation for new EPA rules on methane for new and existing petroleum infrastructure. Some thought it would be out this week. I wonder how far they will go, and, and will they be released today? You know, it won't be released today, but it will be released soon, and it will be a far-reaching regulation. Uh, the methane regulation, the proposed regulation that will be coming soon, will look at emission reductions, deep emission reductions, from both new and existing facilities, oil and gas facilities. But we don't want to also lose focus on the fact that in addition to methane reductions, 
-hmm. We are also looking at volatile organic chemicals. These are potent chemicals that impact neighboring communities and neighboring families. We will see deep emission reductions for public health pollutants like VOCs as well as methane, which is a potent greenhouse yeah. gas. Emission. Forever chemicals. Michael, would you consider a standalone climate bill after this is done to pursue a clean energy grid, the, the component that did not make it in, that $150 billion component that did not make it into the framework, or would that not have enough support to pass Congress as a standalone item? You know, I can't play sort of the, the political, um, you know, uh, pundit on, on, on the merits of that. What I can say is when you look at the Build Back Better framework that is accompanied by the bipartisan infrastructure deal, these are historic investments that will not only help us mitigate climate change and adapt to climate change, but there are historic investments to protect public health. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot in this proposed framework, and it's too early to tell uh, about what the next steps would be after this is passed. Well, I ask you that knowing that Congress is an obstacle here, and I, I wonder what tools the administration might have to address climate on its own through executive actions or other measures if you still want to pursue some of these items after this current debate is over? You know, the president has a, a, a broad uh, tool set, and he's got uh, multiple tools in his toolbox. But EPA has a diverse uh, set of tools as well. You know, we just recently for fi for, uh, finalized a proposed uh, a, a rule that will curtail 85% of hydrofluorocarbons over the next 15 years. That is a very potent greenhouse gas emission. We're going to um, finalize uh, a rule on tailpipe emissions for mm -hmm. uh, cars and trucks and heavy-duty vehicles. Um, as you just mentioned, we're going to be leaning forward with a proposed rule on methane emissions, and we're going to round out these suite of regulations with a very strong and doable rule looking at carbon emissions from power plants. Irrespective of what Congress does, EPA has a suite of options that it can take, and we're going to take them all. I just got, got a, a breaking news headline here, uh, Michael, and I'm glad I'm on the phone with you. As we learn, the Supreme Court has agreed to consider limiting the EPA's authority to cut greenhouse gases from power plants, agreeing just now to hear appeals from coal mining companies and Republican-led states. Is that bad news? You know, I have not seen uh, that that news. Um, obviously, it's breaking news. I haven't seen that. But what I can say is uh, we have seen and learned from uh, previous attempts to regulate uh, coal plants. And there are lots of lessons learned that we know what the courts uh, will accept and won't accept. And so we are given a lot of thought to what that path forward might look like. And we're very optimistic that EPA does have the appropriate statutory authority to reduce CO2 emissions from coal plants. So we'll be taking a close look at the Supreme Court's verdict, but we're not deterred from our mission. EPA Administrator Michael Regan, we thank you for the insights today on Bloomberg. I'm Joe Matthew in Washington. We send it back to Carol Masser in New York. Carol? All right, Joe. Thank you so much. Of course, Joe Matthew, he is host of Sound On on Bloomberg Radio. Catch that at 5 p.m. Wall Street time right here on Bloomberg Radio. And if you missed any of that interview, just uh, check it out online at Bloomberg.com. Joe Matthew there with the EPA, EPA Administrator Michael Regan. It's time now for our weekly crypto update. It's brought to you by Interactive Brokers. Trade crypto for less coin with commissions just 12 to 18 basis points and no hidden spreads or markups. Learn more at ibkr.com slash crypto. All right, so we talked about Ether, second largest cryptocurrency, soaring to a record today, about 4,400. It's backed off of that, but a lot of bullish sentiment around that uh, because of an upgrade to the Ethereum network. And also we've just seen Bitcoin take off uh, big time. In our weekly crypto segment, we've got back with us uh, Matthew Siegel. Matthew Siegel is head of digital assets at Van Eck. He joins us on the phone from New York City. Matthew, October has been a banner month for all, many cryptocurrencies, whether they're meme, stock, meme coins, I almost said meme stocks there, <laughs> meme coins, uh, or more established cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Ethereum. What is the next catalyst as we look to the remainder of the year that's going to continue to send cryptocurrencies higher? Hi, Carol and Tim. Hi. Uh, yeah, the, the story remains the same, which is increased activity on multiple blockchains, Bitcoin and Ethereum and other smart contract protocols. Um, so, you know, there's going to be close to $4 trillion of value that's sent across the Bitcoin network this year. Uh, the same goes for Ethereum. 
that's four times the amount of PayPal growing four times faster. So consumers and businesses around the world uh, adopting this technology as a way to save costs, uh, program instructions into their money, uh, you know, globally, 24/7. It's it's a compelling use case that continues to take market share, and that's the driver of the prices uh, over the last month and for longer. Matt, gotta ask you. You're just back from El Salvador, the Latin American nation. Uh, last month, becoming the world's first country to officially adopt Bitcoin. Who did you talk with? Who did you meet with? What are you hearing about it, and how it's kind of going? Because you know, that's a test lab, if you will, or a test case for us when it comes to cryptocurrencies. Yeah, I recently returned from a trip there, uh, visited government officials, banks, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, went to Bitcoin Beach, was, which was really the initial catalyst for the adoption of Bitcoin as legal tender. Uh, there are now more than 3 million El Salvadorians who have used the Chivo Bitcoin wallet. Uh, they're sending $2 million a day in remittances across the network at zero fees. So if you annualize that, that's close to 3% of GDP because this is an economy that is really dependent on remittances for their growth. Uh, and then the country has also recently begun mining Bitcoin from the energy stranded in their volcanoes. Uh, so so it's really a remarkable achievement that's allowing a very poor emerging market to essentially manufacture scarce money using stranded energy resources that otherwise would would go to waste. Uh, so I found it an incredibly progressive development. I think you'll be hearing more news about this over the next year, whether it's Ukraine, Belarus, one of the French Central African colonies, or maybe even Brazil. Uh, there will be more countries that adopt Bitcoin is legal tender because it is a rational counterbalance to the dollar hegemony that they've lived under for, for so long. Did you actually get to see, Matthew, the Bitcoin mining operations that are harnessing volcanic activity? I did not see it firsthand. That, that will be uh, an experience for, for a second trip. Okay, because I'm just wondering if they're able to do it yet and, and how, success, or how quickly they were able to do that. You mentioned some other countries. Based on what you saw in El Salvador, what do you think this says about where this happens next when or if another country adopts it as legal tender? Sure. Uh, you know, well, some, I think it's 5% of the world economy is currently, you know, facing default to the IMF. So, you know, countries that have been limited or constrained uh, by rules or decisions that, you know, in a way compromise their sovereignty, these are kind of the natural uh, early adopters to try to create uh, a parallel monetary system that restores them some measure of autonomy. And the game theory here is that if, if, if one country doesn't do it, another will. Uh, and El Salvador was, in our view, you know, the first uh, of, a dip, of a tipping point. Uh, so it's hard to predict who will be next, but there are a lot of nations that have adopted the dollar uh, maybe not as their first choice. Right. And what we're learning uh, from El Salvador's experiment is that uh, it is possible to forge another path. Well, just like to some extent emerging markets, we've seen this kind of skip maybe credit card usage and just go right to using the plane, uh, using your phone, excuse me, for mobile payment right, and that becoming your bank and everything financial. I do wonder if there's something to be said with developing nations, um, Matt, when it comes to crypto use. Will they be the ones, the really true, as I said, test sites and really give us the real world usage of this? I, I think that's spot on. Uh, emerging markets often find it r rational to skip an intermediary technology, you know, such as the fax machine and going straight mm -hmm. to the internet. Uh, and you know, that's that's what we're, that's what we're seeing with cryptocurrencies pretty broadly. Okay, we saw the launch of the first futures-backed Bitcoin ETF Bico. last week. Yeah, Bitto. Oh, Bitto. Bitto. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Did I that's say Bitcoin? Okay. Okay. That's okay. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering, Matthew, what we're going to start to see when it comes to investment products that are available not just to retail investors, but uh, from advi for advisors who want to make this available to their clients. Sure. The, the institutional adoption uh, really is the next leg of this story. Uh, by our estimates, it, it, listed companies own about 1% of outstanding Bitcoin. Uh, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust is another... 4%, uh, and then with the emergence of these alternative vehicles such as futures ETFs, that will just, you know, widen the available vehicles that institutions can use to get access to this asset class. Um, so, 
as you may have heard, Bitcoin futures have you know, rather consistently underperformed the spot price. Right. Uh, and so, you know, we continue to believe that it's a physical Bitcoin ETF that will be the well, best vehicle for traditional ex- investors to get exposure to this asset class in a traditional brokerage account, uh, more liquidity, um, you know, better tracking error. Right. Uh, but, um, you know, the regulators have been slow to approve that. Right. There's been a lot of conversations about underlying asset and, and when it comes to futures in, in, in cryptocurrencies. Um, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Matthew Siegel, he's head of digital assets uh, research over at VanEck on the phone in New York City. I don't know why I thought, I thought it was Bico. Bito. Bito. B I T O. Up okay. 1.3% today, by the way. <laughs> As, <laughs> this month, crypto goes one way. <laughs> well, we are less than a half hour away from the end of the trading down this last trading day of the month. Let's get an update on it from Charlie Pellet. Hey, thank you very much. And we have got just about 27 minutes to go before that closing bell clangs on Wall Street. Bitcoin up 1.1% right now. The Pro shares Bitcoin, a Bitcoin strategy ETF up by 1.3%. Stocks drifting as uh, traders weigh disappointing earnings and bond market gyrations sparked by concerns over inflation and monetary tightening. Ten-year yield right now, 1.53%. After earnings, we do have Apple down 2%. Amazon lower by 2.8%. Here's where we stand. NASDAQ back in the green, up two points. Key takeaway here, a little change. Another key takeaway, this will be an up week and an up month for the U.S. stock market. Right now, though, the S&P down two points, lower little change. We've got the Dow up 11, higher and little change. Again, the ten-year, 1.53%. Spot gold down $16 a ounce, down nine tenths of one percent, 1782. Crude pushing higher. West Texas Intermediate up six tenths of one percent, 83.31 a barrel. Pfizer and BioNTech's COVID-19 vaccine has been cleared by regulators for kids between the ages of 5 and 11, a long-awaited pandemic milestone that opens a new phase of the immunization campaign. Dr. Andrew Pekosh is a professor of molecular microbiology and immunology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He was interviewed this morning ahead of the FDA's formal announcement. The data for pediatric COVID-19 vaccinations looks really, really good, particularly with the safety issues and the adverse effects, which were a priority for the FDA advisory panel discussion. It's clear that the risk of COVID-19 in younger populations is less than for the over 65. But it's still a significant risk. And understanding that the data says the vaccines are a safe way to get to immunity as opposed to infection is important. Dr. Bekosh with the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, which is supported by Michael R. Bloomberg, founder of Bloomberg LP and Bloomberg Philanthropies. Pfizer shares up 7 tenths of 1%. Its German partner, BioNTech, the ADR is down 1.6%. AstraZeneca's ADR is up 2 tenths of 1%. Moderna down 6 tenths of 1%. J&J Johnson & Johnson down 3 tenths of 1%. Recapping stocks mixed, the Dow, the S&P, they're both higher. NASDAQ lower down one point. And that's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Thank you so much, Charlie Pellet. This is Bloomberg. That's all right, cause I'm close enough for rock and roll. Close enough for rock and roll. Close enough for rock and roll. I'm close enough for All right. Um, <laughs> we're getting barked at. Uh, what's the song? It's like one of the classic rock dudes, right? Yeah. 80s? 90s? 80s. John Mellencamp? Is it Mellencamp? Congratulations. (sighs) Not John Cougar Mellencamp. Oh, hell to the no. Okay. (laughs) Just John Mellencamp. I'm just going to say. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, So tell us about it. Okay. Let's do. You know, we have this story (laughs) out there. And it's very rare for me to take issue with the, the coverage that we put out. But it's... Facebook's doppelganger ETF rakes in cash on mistaken identity. Now, Uh-oh. you know, what we're talking about here is this exchange traded fund yeah. with the ticker Meta. And of course, yesterday, Facebook renamed itself Meta. Meta Wait, platforms, they to be did? more precise. I had no idea. Oh, yeah, they did. Hashtag sarcasm. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Absolutely. And then you saw trading in this ETF to take off. It's called the Round Hill Ball Metaverse ETF. I mean, that's mm-hmm. what we're talking about. That's, that's right. why Facebook took the name Meta. Uh, it's been around since the end of June. It has $142 million of assets, or at least it did 
uh, as of the latest reading, um, had an inflow of $12.5 million yesterday. But, you know, you want to think of a trade like this as something that's just a case where people are doing things wrong, like metamaterials, for example, or back in the day, buying the stock with the ticker Zoom when Zoom Video did something well, and, you know, the ticker Zoom was in an entirely different company in a different industry. At least this time around, there's a connection. It makes sense, actually, right? There's, it, there's, 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 there's stocks, companies, holdings, right, that maybe you're going to play into the metaverse? Right, and the fourth largest one happens to be the newly renamed uh, meta platforms. I saw that. Or if you prefer Facebook. Almost 6% of yeah, the fund. Yeah, exactly. So... You know, here's a case where you don't necessarily see it as a mistake, or maybe it isn't. Maybe it's just that Facebook's move has kind of brought more attention to this whole idea of the metaverse, hmm. and you have this ETF that was smart enough to grab the ticker symbol, Meta, which is now, of course, the first name of what was Facebook, and then when everybody jumped on board, got to take advantage of it. It's it's an interesting it's sort of yeah. It's an interesting sort of difference than what we see usually when these sort of things pop up. If you want to know more, folks, send me an email. I'll get you the chart, the explanation that goes with it, and everything I do going forward. The email address is dwilson at bloomberg.net. That's dwilson at bloomberg.net. All right, Dave, what's your stock of the day? That would be Vocera Communications, ticker VCRA. Uh, they do communications devices, software. You know, their, their products are uh, used mainly in hospitals so mm -hmm. that doctors and nurses can communicate with each other. Well, they came out with uh, their quarter results late yesterday. Uh, earnings and revenue beating analyst average estimates in a Bloomberg survey. They raised their full year forecast. You put that all together. The shares rose to a record. They're up, as we speak, about 12%, looking like the wow. biggest gain since February. Off and running, now up about 36% this year. Look for Dave's Stock of the Day just after 4.15 p.m. Wall Street time on Facebook, LinkedIn, and on Twitter at The One Day. You could be an auctioneer. Dave Wilson, have a good weekend. All right, off to Nancy Lyons in our D.C. newsroom. Hey, Nance. Thanks, Carol. President Biden is mending fences as he holds one-on-ones in Italy at the G20 summit. In a face-to-face -face with French President Emmanuel Macron, Biden acknowledged the U.S. was clumsy in assembling a submarine security pact with Britain and Australia, which froze out France and its $66 billion arrangement with Australia. The president went on to say the U.S. has no older, no more loyal ally. France is an extremely, extremely valued partner. Extremely, and a power in and of itself. And so I don't know any reason that we have the same values. Biden met earlier in the day with Pope Francis, who told the president he's a good Catholic and should keep taking communion. The FDA is following through on recommendations from an advisory panel on authorizing the use of Pfizer's vaccine in children ages 5 to 11. Shots, though, won't go into arms until the CDC analyzes the data and agrees with the authorization. New York Attorney General Letitia James is running for governor. She posted a campaign video on Twitter today. I'm Letitia James, and I've spent my career guided by a simple principle. Stand up to the powerful on behalf of the vulnerable. James, as Attorney General, has investigated former President Trump and launched an inquiry into sexual misconduct allegations that took down Governor Andrew Cuomo. She'll be challenging for the nomination fellow Democrat Governor Kathy Hochul, who'd been Cuomo's lieutenant governor. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. All right. Uh, Friday edition of Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Master, Tim Stenovec, you sent this story by our Anders Mellon and Dana Hall about Tesla's hidden billionaire. Yeah, it's a Bloomberg exclusive. Yeah. Uh, and it's just fascinating because Dan has covered this in the past, uh, the idea of retail investors who have made a lot of money when it comes to Tesla. And she's in the past written about, I think it was called Tesla, Tesla Nairs. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And she and Anders are at it again. But talking about uh, Leo Koguan, uh, who um, has uh, built up a, val a stake in Twitter, 
in the billions of dollars. Not just a stake. Or excuse me, a Tesla. Not just a stake. Tesla's third largest individual shareholder. So behind fellow billionaire Larry Ellison and none other than Elon Musk, uh, the richest person in history. Like, how did it happen? He's a billionaire too, right? Uh, in his own right. Um, and I guess the value of a supposed holding soared and soared to $4 billion, $5 billion, and now to more than $7 billion. Bank records provided to Bloomberg News by Koguan and confirmed by people familiar with his investments show he owns 6.31 million Tesla shares as of late September. He also held 1.82 million options, giving him the right to buy Tesla between $450 to $550 a share, contracts that are deeply in the money after the stock this week jumped past $1,000. And our team caught up with him uh, via Zoom. He was in his living room, 63 floors above Singapore's harbor. Uh, and I guess he's got a New Jersey technology business that he owns, which stre stretches from the Bantam Island to the uh, south, uh, to Malaysia, to the north, to Indonesia, to the west, I mean, all over. And uh, I guess... <laughs> I love this quote. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. <laughs> Fortunately, I win more of the time than I lose, which is why he's a billionaire and you and I are in the studio working. <laughs> <laughs> he's winning right now. Stranger claims have been made and proved to be true at an age when unfathomable fortunes sometimes seem to appear out of thin air. Tesla's relentless rise has minted countless Teslanaires and some suspect more than a few as yet hidden billionaires. He's been uh, adding to his stake in Tesla since September and he buys both shares and options. It's a great story. Check it out at Bloomberg.com.